Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to a new stream. We got a good one for you today. I'm excited. Can everybody hear me okay? How's everybody doing? Everybody, everybody doing good? I'm gonna do some, some genetic engineering, and I think, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. I know we haven't, uh, haven't done a, done a stream in a little bit, so I'm, I'm excited for this one. How's everybody doing? Everybody hear me okay? Just before we get started, just, you know, if I got to mess with the audio, audio, now's the time. All right. All righty. Well, I, I think... I think we're I think we're good to go. So uh, before before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. As you can see, we're back. You know, um, if you if you haven't been uh, watching the channel lately, uh, there's been a whole bunch of new shorts. There's a whole bunch of new content coming. It's a new year. I'm real excited. So yeah, I think uh, without further ado, we're probably going to get just we're going to get right into it. Um, as we did last time with this uh, stream, uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to just talk for a bit like we're gonna I'm gonna do the presentation I'm gonna just talk uh, we've got our moderator uh, who is going to be recording questions and I've also I'm gonna be maintaining a list of questions as well uh, so that way I'll answer just a ton of stuff at the end of the stream so be sure to stick around for that um, because there's a lot to go through uh, but I also I don't want to get too distracted with answering the questions as we go so this way there's just sort of a better flow for people who are just sort of you know watching the whole thing straight through all righty um, so, uh, let's, let's get into it, I think. This is Intro to Genetic Engineering Part 2, and as was heavily requested, this time we're going to be talking about designing basic DNA. If you haven't seen the first stream, I would highly recommend watching that. Um, it is sort of... Uh, it's a really good overview of sort of the basics of genetic engineering, some, some lots of good resources for how to learn a lot of the background stuff that's going to be really important for, uh, well, this stream. But we're going to go over a lot of the basics again, so don't, don't be too worried. But again, I, I would recommend checking out that stream after this one if you haven't seen it already. Um, today we're going to be talking about designing DNA. So let's go through it. So this is what we're going to cover today. Um, what is a gene? What are its pieces? What is a plasmid? What are its basic requirements? High copy versus low copy plasmids, codons, back translation, genetic part notation. Um, you can see this. You can see the slide. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But basically, it, it's going to go through as, as much of this stuff as we can. And we're going to do a little bit of a presentation. I'm going to kind of go through the basics, and then we're going to actually hop over to a genetic engineering program, uh, like a DNA coding program, and we're going we're gonna to do some code. So we're going to go through all this stuff first. Um, so like I say, um, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to just, you know, post them in the chat. Our, our moderator will keep track of them and we should be good to go and you'll be able to, uh, well, I'll, I'll be able to answer everything near the end. Okay, so let's get right into it. Today we're going to be covering what I call the hello world equivalent. You know, when you're first learning how to code, you know, literally the first thing you do is, you know, print hello world. This is sort of the same thing because you got to start somewhere and learning how to write DNA is kind of weird. Like it's, it's, a, it's a weird experience and there's also no compiler. So you don't actually get to, unless you have the DNA made, you can't actually test it, right? Like there's not like a quick uh, compiler where you can just do the thing. So the, the very first experiment that for all intents and purposes, literally everybody does is this. So this is GFP, it's green fluorescent protein. And the thing you're looking at here specifically is um, a Petri dish with E. coli that have been modified to express green fluorescent protein. Now, this is not just any GFP, it's a very special one, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, and like I say, it's, it's the simplest. It was also one of the very first things that was ever genetic and like genetically engineered. Um, the protein was discovered, I think back in the seventies, but it was first modified and put into a new organism in about 92. So this is, this is fairly recent. Like this is not that long ago. I mean, it's, you know, 30 years ago at this point, but still it's, it's not that long ago in the, the, the history of humanity that we've been able to, to do this. And the fact that we can now do this casually is, is kind of amazing. But 
this protein, uh, not this specific one, but but green fluorescent protein in general, came from a species of jellyfish. That code was then isolated and copied out and then moved into bacteria. And that, to me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that, that to me marks the beginning of genetic engineering. Like, this was really the point where humans' ability to start messing with DNA really started. Because before that, it was through breeding. And breeding is, is genetic en engineering. And anyone who, who tries to tell you otherwise is selling something. But this is the point where we could go in and very carefully modify genetics, as opposed to breeding where you're just kind of, you know, randomizing code and hoping for the best and selecting based simply on, on phenotypes. So let's start with the basics because we're going to have to build up to it. One of the things with genetic engineering is it's really a game of knowledge. The more you know, the more you're able to do. And unlike computer code, like with your, if you're coding Python, right? Python is a very abstract language. You don't really need to know what the transistors are doing to be able to write Python code. Yeah, DNA is not... It is not Python. You really need to know what everything is doing in order to be able to do it well. There's a little bit of abstraction you can get away with, but to really be good at it, you really need to know what all of the biochemistry is doing because DNA is not code. It is a molecule. It is a thing that is manipulated physically. So this comes with a lot of uh, quirks and challenges that we have to address. All right, so this is the what we call the central dogma of... Uh, biology, right? This is this is the most basic thing that you need to know in order to understand biology, which is that it it flows in a specific direction. So at the at the start at the top we have DNA, and DNA is the code of life, right? Like it is the basic instructions for all living things. But to go from DNA to an organism, there's a few steps that have to happen. So what this particular image is, is showing is actually a more complicated case. We're going to look at a more simple case than this. Um, but the, the thing that happens from DNA is a copy of that DNA needs to be made out of RNA. So DNA, RNA, DNA is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. They're very similar molecules, but they're slightly different. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, whereas RNA is ribonucleic acid. You know, that, that extra um, oxygen does make a, a little bit of a difference. But for all intents and purposes, it's, it's two different flavors of code. One flows into the next. So you go DNA and then RNA. And then the RNA is read and turned into protein. Like the, the RNA contains the, the instructions for making protein and then there's a, a protein complex, which we'll talk about, which reads it and turns that into the correct proteins. <clears throat> so this is the basic structure of a gene. And this is something you're really going to want to know because it's very, very important. There are, and this is a massive simplification. There is a lot of other things that can be going on, but at its core, this is the most basic structure. So it always starts with a promoter. So the promoter is a piece of code where proteins will bind to that bit of DNA and start reading the DNA from that location. Like it really is where the whole process gets going. If there's no promoter, nothing will happen. And there's also, there, there'll be other things that can happen. So the promoter can contain sequences where other th things other than the, like the basic uh, transcription mechanisms can bind, uh, but that kind of gets into a more complex uh, case. Um, but starting starting at the basics, a promoter is where DNA transcription will start. The next thing that is really important to notice is the COSAC slash ribosome binding site. The reason there's two different names here is because this changes depending on what type of organism you're talking about. So you've got to remember that I'm going to be making a lot of generalizations here, but DNA and the way that it's handled is actually subtly different if we're talking about, say, a bacteria versus an animal cell. Like, yes, they both use DNA, but the way that that DNA is structured is subtly different. And most of what I'm going to be talking about today is the bacterial case because it's simpler. M mammalian DNA has its benefits, but it can also get really complicated really quickly. Um, and a lot of the hard and fast rules that are taught, like if you take a, a biology class and they're teaching you this same information, 
they almost always are referring to the bacterial case because the bacterial case is just easier. The mammalian case is more complicated. So in a mammalian system, it's a Kozak, which is basically just a sequence of letters immediately before the start of the coding sequence, whereas a ribosome binding site is a little further upstream, and, and I will talk about up or downstream later, but it basically is where the ribosome will actually bind to the RNA. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a second, but that's the subtle difference. The, the, and so you always have the COSAC or ribosome binding site after the promoter, but before the start codon. So the start codon is, and we'll talk about codons in a second, it's basically the point where the protein sequence starts, right? So at the, at the end of the day, this DNA is coding for a protein, and you've got to have a, po a point where that starts. And it's always, it's well, it's almost always the same codon. Um, in this case, it's almost always A, T, and G. And, and I'll show you that in a second. But A, T, G, that's the start codon. Then from the start codon, you'll have a long sequence of codons and, and code that codes for protein. And then after, to mark the end, you, like you've got to have something to mark the start in the beginning, or the, the start in the end, right? So the start codon marks the start, and the stop codon marks the stop, or the end. Um, after the stop codon, which is on the far end here, you have a terminator. So if a promoter is what allows proteins to bind to the DNA to get this whole process started, the terminator is what makes them pop off and let go. So it, it stops the process. And those are sort of the basic pieces. Like I say, there's a lot of fine details, and you'll see a lot of this when we get into the coding program, where you'll see the subtleties. But again, this will change if you're doing mammalian versus plant versus bacteria or algae or, or something weird. Um, you know, I say that generally a start codon is ATG. The, the thing with biology is for every rule, there's 100 exceptions. So while it is generally ATG, there are some weird exceptions that it's not. But for all intents and purposes, it's always ATG. Um, so um, moving, moving right along. So here's some, here's some useful notation. Well, I say useful notation. Here's some notation. Here's the notation that I actually, you know, find is useful. Um, where if you're reading papers or you're reading uh, any kind of documentation of somebody's uh, research, a lot of the time they'll draw out a sort of graphical version of the DNA, right? Like it doesn't make sense to write the code because... Code, like all DNA code can be broken up into little sections, be it the promoter or a coding sequence or multiple coding sequences or whatever. Um, a lot of the time you'll draw sort of a cartoon to sort of make this easier to understand. And um, these are some of the, the symbols that tend to be used. So for example, uh, a coding sequence, like a protein coding sequence is, this, uh, is either a, a big fat arrow uh, or it's this sort of arrow box looking thing. I don't know if my mouse is being captured, uh, but if it's not, uh, in the in the top row, it's the fourth glyph here, uh, the fourth and fifth glyphs. So these are are generally what you use for a coding sequence versus a promoter is usually this arrow with a right angle. It's the third row down here. Terminators are a T, etc. Um, so here's an example of this. So. Like I say, promoter is the bent arrow. A ribosome binding site is the sort of hemisphere uh, or the half circle. A protein coding sequence is the boxed uh, arrow and a terminator is a T. So in a basic case, right, like you'll show the promoter, you'll show a ribosome binding site because it's also important that like there's hundreds of different promoters. There's hundreds of different ribosome binding sites. There's millions of different protein coding sequences. So when you're trying to convey this information or, or you're trying to understand information that's in a paper, um, you know, it's, it's very helpful um, to be able to describe it to somebody in a simpler sense instead of having to show every letter of the code because the, at the end of the day, the, the individual letters of the code are important to the thing functioning but not important to a human understanding what it is you're trying to do. Um, so, you know, it, you'd draw it like this where you've got, you know, your arrow and then your, your, uh, half circle and then your protein coding sequence and then a pair of terminators. Um, but you would usually put a part number, 
um, or, or some sort of descriptor of the thing. So if it's a ribosome binding site, you'd say, you know, ribosome binding site. And then if there's any kind of, like, if this is a known part, you just, you write the name of the part underneath it. Now, the other, uh, the other side, or, or the other thing in this uh, graph, or, or this uh, graphic, I should say, um, is a specific case where one protein interacts with the promoter of another gene. And now this is kind of a more advanced concept and we're gonna, I'm gonna do a whole video just on these because you can do some really interesting things where you're building genetic circuits. But I just wanted to show this notation really quickly because this is the notation of genetic circuits. In the same way that we can have um, circuits in electronics where you have you know a NOT gate or a, an AND gate or whatever, you, you can do the same thing with genetics. And this is the way that it, it tends to be written. So if you've got one protein, like, so if you've got a case where if you express one protein, when that protein is expressed, it grabs onto the promoter of another gene and turns it on, that would be an activator. So that it's drawn with a little arrow. Whereas if when that protein is expressed, it grabs onto a promoter and prevents that gene being read, that, was a, that would be an inverter. So that's something that turns a gene off when another gene is turned on. Again, this is probably more complicated than we're going to be able to get into today, but I wanted to show it because we are actually going to see a simple example of this when we get to the code. But yeah, so this is, um, you know, it, this is sort of the basic notation and it's, it's pretty helpful to just have this so that when you're, when you're reading papers, because this like getting information about genetic engineering you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of the resources where you can find code and, and, and this sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of reading papers. It's a lot of reading papers to figure out what it is that a scientist has done, how does their DNA work, and then being able to go from the, the cartoon that they draw to the code and figure out what each piece of that code is actually doing. And, and cartoons like this are, are very helpful for conveying that information. Uh, so again, this is the basic gene, just as a quick reminder. Uh, and so I, I talked about the start codon and stop codon. Well, these are codons. So all DNA uh, is broken up into three letter sections called codons. And specifically, th this only applies to uh, protein coding sections. So like a promoter, the the... The letters can be anything. It, they're, they're not broken up into the three-letter codons. This is only referring to the bit of code that actually codes for a protein. So these are broken up into three-letter segments where each set of three letters codes for a specific amino acid. Naturally, there are 21 amino acids, and you can see they're all color-coded here. So, for example, if you have TTT, it's phenylalanine, whereas if you have um, GCT, it's alanine, GTT is uh, valine. Um, now, remember I, I talked about a, a start codon and a stop codon? So, the start codon is ATG, and it always codes for a, an amino acid called methionine. So, generally... And again, again, I'm putting a big asterisk here because there are exceptions, but generally the first amino acid in every single protein is methionine because of the start codon. Again, there are some organisms that don't use methionine. There are some exceptions to this, but in the general case of E. coli or human cells, methionine is always the start. Um, so when the different proteins are reading the DNA... When it sees ATG, it knows that that is where the protein is starting from. So, so generally, you've got the ribosome binding site, and then there'll be a little spacer, and then you'll have ATG, and that's where the actual protein starts. For stop codons, there's actually three of them. And you'll see this when we get to the coding part, but it's generally helpful to include more than one of them. So when I, whenever I'm doing code, I'll include three. Sometimes I'll include six if I'm really paranoid. But generally two is sufficient. You know, three is overkill and six is absurd. But you'll, you'll include one, uh, two or three of these. So, for example, when you really want something to, to stop, you, you might write T-A-A-T-A-G. Or maybe T-A-A-T-A-A. -A -A -A, 
right? So you see the the three different stop codons here. You just you just pick two. Um, every organism has a preference, and you should generally be picking the one that your organism prefers. But they all work. Just you know, some work better than others. This is why I tend to do two because it, it really makes sure that the ribosome lets go and stops making protein. Otherwise, you'll end up with a bunch of extra junk stuck to your protein that you don't want, which nobody nobody wants that. But yeah, these are codons. Um, if you just look up codon table, um, you'll you'll find this. Also, I just realized I didn't I didn't mention um, for for those who want to follow along, uh, there's a GitHub link in the description. And if you follow that, there's a PDF of both this presentation and the presentation from the last stream. So, like I say, if you want to follow along, um, all that information is there. Those are also links in the description to other videos that we've done. And um, if there's any important stuff, uh, I'll be putting links down there after the stream. Um, also, in that GitHub, I'm going to be putting a folder with all of the DNA code that we end up working on today. It's not there yet um, because I wanted to actually, you know, do the thing first, but it'll be there uh, for later, basically. Um, so yeah, this is this is codons. Um, if you're ever if you ever need this information, you can just look up DNA codon table, and you know a hundred different versions of this will come up. Um, they all mean the same thing. Uh, one one thing that's not shown here though is that every organism prefers certain codons. And this is not like a preference in the way that like, you know, you prefer vanilla ice cream and your friend prefers chocolate. Th this is like a chemical preference. So um, when we talk about the ribosome in a second, part of the way that DNA is read and turned into protein is something called tRNA. So basically, it's this little chunk of twisted up RNA with an amino acid stuck to the end of it. And three letters of that tRNA are the opposite of whatever the codon is. Each organism will have different levels of each tRNA. So they, they generally have all of them, but they'll have... For, so for example, they may have lots and lots of tRNA that matches the uh, CCT codon for proline, but maybe they don't have a lot that will match CCC. So if you're working in an organism that has a significant preference for one codon over the other, it is very important that when you're writing your code, you're mainly using the codons that they like. Because if you're using rare codons, what can happen is as the protein is being transcribed or, or, or translated, right? Like as the protein is being made, the population of the tRNA available in the cell can literally run out. And if that happens, protein synthesis just stops, the ribosome ejects the protein unfinished, and you have a bunch of unfinished garbage in your cell, which will not be doing the thing that you want it to be doing. So it's very important that when you're coding, you're picking codons that your organism likes. And you can find reference tables for most of the standard lab organisms for which codons you're supposed to be using. And also a lot of the uh, coding programs... Um, will have um, a feature that will basically do this for you. And, and I'll show you that later. But yeah, so this is codons. Very important, um, but this is sort of the basic building blocks. Like this is the closest to, you know, binary uh, or a binary equivalent of, of DNA. Okay, this is the ribosome. This is the tRNA I was talking about. So the ribosome has two main subunits. There's the, the large subunit and the small unit. Remember, biologists are terrible at naming things. So, you, you know, you call it what you call it. But this is what I'm talking about, where you've got a, a string of RNA, and you've got these tRNA with an amino acid on the end coming into the ribosome, matching to the RNA that's being read, and then through a, a, a biochemical process, the amino acid that's stuck to the tRNA is fused to the growing protein chain, and then the tRNA is cleaved off, and then the whole thing shifts over like clockwork, allowing a new tRNA to come in, read the next codon, and repeat the process until the whole thing's done. Uh, when you hit a stop codon, the tRNA that hits basically sort of gums up the works a little bit and causes an ejection. Uh, so that's that's how that actually happens. But something to keep in mind, while this is a very useful picture, 
you'll find that with biology and in papers and in textbooks and all this kind of stuff, you'll find a lot of cartoons like this where it's very, very, very simplified. Cartoons are not reality. This is what uh, the large subunit of a ribosome actually looks like. It's this mishmash of proteins and DNA and RNA and just this clump of biochemical function. And, you know, there's a reason that we draw two circles. Because trying to draw this thing would be a nightmare. But just remember that whenever you see a cartoon in... Um, a paper or a textbook or something, it's it always means something like this, which has way more structure to it than is being implied. Biochemistry is hard. It's really complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces. You got to simplify things for the sake of like a human understanding it. But it's important to remember that when we're talking about these things, they are physical structures. A protein is a physical structure, you know, and that structure defines its function. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, okay, so these are the amino acids. We, we talked about them briefly when we were talking about the codons, but this is what they actually look like. So you'll see that they all have this uh, carboxylic acid group, uh, which is the uh, O double bonded, and then the hydroxyl group on the end. And they also have an amine group, which is the NH2. So when you make a protein, you're... you're um, you're forming a chain by sticking the amines to the hydroxyl group. Um, and each one will get stuck to the next. And every amino acid has what's called a side chain. So, for example, if you see, uh, let's look at arginine, for example. Arginine, you have your uh, carboxylic acid, you have your amine group, and then you've got this long tail where you have uh, three uh, nitrogen groups. That's a side chain. Each amino acid has a unique side chain, and that's what gives them their properties. Um, some of them are charged, some of them are not charged, some of them are polar, some of them are hydrophobic. Um, there's also some special cases. So, for example, cysteine has a thiol group on it. It's got a sulfur on the end. That sulfur group allows proteins to form disulfide bridges. So if you have two cysteines in two different parts of a, a protein, the, the two sulfurs will actually stick together. And this is one way that proteins can build a complex structure consistently. Um, so, you know, also a thing to note, because this is something that really bothers me when this is taught. Teachers and professors will have you memorize this chart, which is stupid. There's absolutely no reason you need to memorize this. We have a phone in your pocket. You can Google it. You can just pull. I, like, I do a lot of genetic engineering. I don't have this memorized. I did for a time when I, you know, had to pass my biochemistry class. But nobody nobody needs to memorize this. Unless you're working on, the, on something that requires it, it's very rare that you actually need to know this. Generally, you can look it up. That said, there are some important things to know depending on what you're doing. So, for example, like uh, a histidine tag, right? Like a, or a, a histidine here. Um, some, there's something called a hist tag or a histidine tag. And, and we'll see that when we get to, to code. Um, the reason a histidine tag works is because of the uh, ring structure on the end of it. It's called an imidazole group. That imidazole allows histidine to stick to certain metal ions. And this is really important. If you want your protein to stick to something and or be able to, say, extract your protein out of a complex mixture, you need to be able to selectively stick just your protein to something else. So a hist tag is a really common way of doing this. And so you'll have six histidines in a row. And that combination of histidines is able to stick to nickel or cobalt or copper. And if you have a resin that has nickel ions on it, it allows the histidines to stick, so that way you can selectively isolate just the protein that has this hist tag. It's a really common procedure, it's something that you do all the time in the lab, but that's really the only time where you kind of need to know these proteins off the top of your head. Um, or the, these aminos off the top of your head, I should say. But generally, all of this information you can just look up when you need it, and there's there's really no point in memorizing it. Um, my my biochemistry prof professor was a bit of a dick and had us not only memorize all of these structures, but also the pKa values, the pI values, and a whole bunch of other information about this, which is asinine because again, you have your phone in your pocket, you can just look it up. If you need it, you could look it up. 
Um, so that's just an important thing to remember. Okay, when you start sticking amino acids together, you start making what are called polypeptides. Um, and these polypeptides are um, basically just a string of amino acids. When you have a string of amino acids, they start forming shapes. So the some of the most basic shapes that they can form is an alpha helix, which is, which is like a coil, uh, or a pleated sheet, where you'll have sort of a wavy pattern and then a wavy pattern and the two will will line up like this and then you'll have another one and another one and another one and you can end up with like a big crystalline chunk of amino acids excuse me um when you as more and more amino acids get, gets added as the protein gets bigger these basic structures start self-assembling into a larger structure so the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids the secondary structure is these basic building blocks of helixes and sheets the tertiary structure is what happens when all of that comes together and makes a globule of protein. And then you could have what are called a quaternary structure. So a lot of proteins, or, or a lot of complexes, I should say, are not made of one protein. Like there's a lot of proteins in nature that don't exist on their own. The vast majority of them exist as some complex of two or more proteins. Now, this could be two identical proteins or four identical proteins or three identical proteins, or it could be 18 different proteins that all fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, and only when all of the pieces come together does it actually function the way that it's supposed to. So, for example, uh, ATP synthase, which I, I unfortunately don't have a picture of, um, is one of the protein complexes that's responsible for generating ATP, which is the main energy currency in every cell of your body. It's huge. It's something like 18 or 20 different proteins all stuck together. Many of the, like, multiple copies of the same protein, some copies of different proteins. It's a huge, huge, huge structure. But it only functions if all of the pieces are there. If you go into the DNA and break one of those pieces, the whole thing won't work. Um, also, the cell won't live, so, you know, that's not a good plan. But this is what I mean. Like, Quaternary structure becomes very, very important to the overall biochemical function of one of these assemblies. So these, th this was all kind of the basics. I really did have to gloss over an overwhelming amount of it, but that's kind of because it's just the basics and I kind of want to get to the actual coding stuff, but it's all the stuff that you sort of need to know. If you're new to biology, um, these are some resources that I think are very, very helpful. Um, the crash course is amazing. I mean, this is that's a fucking understatement of the year. Um, Crash Course is utterly fantastic. If you're just learning biology, their visualizations and the way that they teach it is really, really great. Highly recommend watching through their course on uh, biology, biochemistry, organic chemistry, all of the stuff that you got to know to be able to do genetic engineering well. Um, if you're more of a book person, Essential Cell Biology is sort of the best textbook that I've found that covers a lot of this. Um, when you get into the uh, genetic engineering stuff, I like this book. It's called uh, Synthetic Biology, a Primer. Um, this deals with a lot of the stuff that I do, which is going from rather than let's just express um, like one protein. This is let's express many proteins, like pathways, whole, whole complex assemblages of proteins and get them to do something really interesting, right? Like just making GFP is neat, but it's not... Um, what I would call uh, particularly complex or useful. There, there are cases, don't get me wrong, where expressing a single protein can do something very interesting. But a lot of the more interesting stuff is when you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, a few different proteins all having to interact and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, another one, this is much more advanced, but iBiology is another really great channel. Um, I, I highly recommend them. Like I say, it's more advanced. They're not really talking about the basics. They're talking about like the nuts and bolts of uh, some really, really complex biology. But it, it, if you want to see what you can do when you deeply understand this stuff, and you, you also have large amounts of capital on hand, um, iBiology is, is the place to go because it really lets you do crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. All right, plasmids. Oh, plasmids. Okay, so if, if DNA is the most basic thing in biology, plasmids are the most basic tool for genetic engineering, right? 
Everything we do revolves around plasmids. Even things where you're going to try and put DNA into the genome of an organism, you're using a plasmid to do it. The way that I like to describe plasmids is it's sort of like a CD, which I realize this is becoming a very dated reference because um, <laughs> who uses CDs anymore? Um, but yeah, so plasmids are, are like a blank CD, right? They're, they're a structure that you can load code onto that allow it to be easily handled and then applied. This is a plasmid. It's a ring of DNA. Um, and it always has at least three pieces. A lot of the time there'll be more to it, but it always has at least three. So thing number one, you've got a, uh, a target gene, right? You've got the thing that you actually want it to do. Um, you'll have a promoter to drive that target gene. You'll have a terminator. But one, one target gene is always in there. The other thing that, that is always in there is an antibiotic resistance gene or some sort of selectable marker. When you put the DNA into the thing that you want to put it into, you got to be able to select for which cells this actually worked because biology is a game of st statistics, right? So if you're modifying a batch of E. coli, there are billions of cells or, or at the very least millions upon millions of cells in your little tube. You'll be putting in millions and millions of copies of your DNA but you might only get thousands where the DNA goes into the cell properly. So you need to be able to remove all of the cells that didn't take in the new gene properly or the new DNA properly so that you only have the modified ones in your final population. Generally, this is done with antibiotic resistance, but this can also be done with something called an oxytrophic marker. So antibiotic resistance is very straightforward. You, let's say you're doing E. coli, you put an antibiotic into your, your media in your Petri dish. You give the, the modified cells resistance to that antibiotic. So the only cells that end up growing on the plate are the ones resistant to the antibiotic. Nice and simple. An oxytrophic marker is a little different. It's kind of nice because then you're not using antibiotics, which is always good because, you know, the less antibiotic resistance that exists, uh, the better. Um, but basically the way this works is... You kind of, it's one of those like chicken and egg things, like where you, you have to have a modified starting organism in order for this to work. But in the case of yeast, for example, you can go in and break their ability to synthesize some crucial chemical. Let, sometimes it's an amino acid, sometimes it's a, other, like a nucleotide, like it, it's something inherent that they need to survive. And if they don't have it, they don't live. So the way that you, if, so basically you break the, the gene in the, the, let's say yeast genome. So it can't produce adenine, for example. Then in your plasmid, you include a functional copy of the adenine synthase gene. So this way, if the new DNA ends up in the yeast, now they're able to actually produce the missing chemical, so they'll able they're they're able to survive. So then you can grow them on media that is devoid of that chemical, so that the yeast can't get that chemical from the media, and so without it they'll just die. But only the ones that have taken in the new DNA are able to produce it and therefore survive. the The last thing that's really important is uh, an origin of replication. Now, this gets a little weird in, say, mammalian cells or even yeast cells because they handle this differently. But in bacteria specifically, and especially E. coli, um, every plasmid has what's called an origin of replication. Basically, this is the spot on the DNA where the DNA copying mechanism of the cell grabs on and starts the copying process. Now, I don't have a graphic of this because, you know, it's, it's details. But... Um, Basically, the, the copying mechanism will grab onto that spot um, and then start copying in both directions. Uh, and and you'll, you'll end up with two sets of DNA and then they kind of like bleb apart once they're finished. But without an origin of replication, your DNA will be gone almost immediately. Like, it, like within a generation, the, the DNA is just gone. Um, and E. coli have a, a doubling time of 20 minutes. So this means that even if your DNA is in there, they will not 
la it will not last long enough that you'll ever see your modified gene in the final population and it will just be lost. So origin of replication, super, super important. But the origin of replication also controls how many copies of that DNA exist in the cell. Um, so this is where we get into high copy versus low copy. And, and I think on the next, yeah, okay. So these are the, the main characteristics of a plasmid. So basically this is, so, like when you're designing DNA, these are all the sorts of things that you need to be taking into account because they're going to ultimately set the properties of the thing, right? So step number one is, does it is it integrative or non-integrative? Basically what this means is, does your plasmid cut itself and the host's DNA and then shove all of the code permanently into the genome of the organism or does it just exist as a an episomal thing like does it just exist on its own in the cell so in bacteria right if it has an origin of replication it can very happily exist on its own and it will just be copied no problem as the cell divi divides uh, whereas in animal cells we don't we don't do origins of replication like mammalian cells don't have ORIs um, you'll always have one in, in a plasmid that you design because you're, the, the ORI is not there for the mammalian cells. They're there for growing it in E. coli so you can make more copies of the DNA for like just lab handling. Um, but mammalian cells don't actually have an ORI. So you have, if you want the DNA to stick around for any amount of time, you actually need it to integrate into the genome. Um, so this can be very important. But in, in bacteria, you can get away with it not being integrative just fine. Unless you're trying to do something industrial where you really don't want the DNA to change, right? Like you don't want the DNA to suddenly go missing as you're trying to grow a ferment that's 30,000 liters. Like the DNA really needs to stick around. So in that case, you would use something integrative where you might use CRISPR or any any similar tool to cut the DNA of the host's uh, genome and also of the plasmid that you've inserted and, and have them like schmoo together and fuse. So this is, you know, that, that's that's the big difference there. Um, high copy versus low copy basically is, liter it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's how many copies of the DNA are present. Now, your choice of high copy versus low copy really depends what you're trying to do. So sometimes you'll build a plasmid not to actually express the protein that you're interested in, but literally just for handling, right? Like when you're when you're moving DNA around in a tube, you know, you'll only have a finite amount. And to make more of it, the easiest way to do this is to just put it into some E. coli, have the E. coli do the copying, and then extract that DNA back out of the E. coli. If you just want a lot of DNA, high copy is better. But if you want... Um, oh, thank you, Merp Derp. Um, but if you want actual protein expression... High copy, like having hundreds of copies of the DNA does not actually make your your uh, protein synthesis better. It tends to overwhelm the system. And so you'll end up with lower protein expression than if there were less copies of the DNA. So if you want protein expression, uh, I mean, at least personally, I tend to go with low copy plasmids. Whereas if you're doing DNA handling, you're, you want high copy so that there's physically a lot of DNA per cell. So that when you extract it, you're getting a maximum yield of DNA. Uh, the next thing that you want uh, to know is, is your target protein, when, when you code this all up, does it just run, like is it which is called constitutive, or is it inducible? Inducible means in its off, it, like it has an on state and an off state. And unless you give it a specific chemical to turn it on, it just doesn't express. So the most common... Uh, like the, the most common way to do this in bacteria is the lac operon. So this is, a, this means it's triggered by lactose. So when there is lactose in the media, it turns the G, the DNA on, like the lactose ends up in the cell. There's a, a chemical mechanism that detects the lactose and allows that bit of DNA to actually be read. It's, um, earlier in the, in the, the stream, we talked about a, an inverter. This is a case of an inverter where, if there is no lactose, the gene is off, whereas if there is lactose, the gene is on. So that's the difference between inducible versus constitutive. And, and your choice, 
of one or the other. It sort of depends what you're trying to do. Generally, if you just want to make a protein, like if you just want to make GFP, for example, don't do inducible. For some reason, most people, when they write DNA, choose inducible plasmids. And for the life of me, I do not understand why. Because it adds extra work and it adds extra hassle and it gains you basically nothing. The cases where you would want something to be inducible is in the context of something where if it just runs on its own, it might break something. Or you want to be able to very carefully control the level of that protein. So let's say you're, the protein that you're trying to make is an enzyme. And that enzyme makes a chemical. If that chemical that it makes is toxic, you might not want to have the, the enzyme be produced in humongous quantity because that means it'll also make the chemical in humongous quantity and that could kill the cell. Or maybe it's making one chemical and then you have a second gene that's making a, that uses that chemical to make the next step. You, maybe you want to control the levels of each to try and find a sweet spot. Or maybe you only want to turn the protein on at a certain time in the life cycle of the E. coli. So, for example, there's, there's some promoters that will only turn on at a certain growth stage of, the, of an E. coli's life, right? So there's one promoter called uh, OSMY that only turns on when E. coli are basically done growing. So when the E. coli detect that there's no more food or very little food left in the media, they hit, so they, they grow very, very quickly, and then they hit, they detect no more food, and then they plateau. So OSMY is a gene uh, that normally only turns on in the plateau phase. So it's, it's part of how the E. coli handle um, their sort of life cycle to make sure that they don't basically eat themselves to death. And, and they, they slow themselves down. And so you'll have different proteins turn on at different parts of, parts of their life cycle. So you could hijack this system and have a gene turn on only at the end of its life cycle. I don't know why you would want to do that, but you could. Um, and I've, I've seen some constructs that do it this way. Again, I, I don't... If you're just trying to make a protein, I don't know why you would want to do this. But for some synthetic biology stuff and, and for some learning applications, people do this just to like prove that it can be done. Um, but again, there's a lot of stuff that academics do that just baffle me as to why, because I, I'm convinced this, they're just making their, their lives harder on themselves. Okay. Um, the last thing to know about a plasmid is literally how many genes is this thing going to be making? Uh, for two reasons. One, the more genes it has to make, the more complex it is, and also the, the physically larger the plasmid is going to be. And if a plasmid gets too large, you have to include extra bits in it, otherwise you'll lose it. Um, and it becomes very difficult to handle. So, like, bacteria tend to like plasmids that are no bigger than, say, 15 or 20,000 letters long. And, I mean, that's really on the high end. Anything bigger than that, and they have a habit of just shedding the DNA. Like, they'll, they'll either break it into pieces and get rid of it, uh, or they, they have a habit of losing it very quickly. So you have to add extra features to your plasmids in order for something that big to stick around. There's what's called a, a BAC, or bacterial artificial chromosome. If you want to stick an absolutely gigantic piece of DNA into a E. coli... You need to use a back, but in order, but a, a back contains extra functions that makes the E. coli think that it's a chromosome and it, it handles the DNA differently. So this is one of the reasons why you got to keep in, keep this in mind. If you're going for something gigantic, it you you have to handle it differently. Um, but also, the more genes you put in there, the more metabolic burden you're putting on the E. coli, and like you'll you'll slow its growth or just straight up kill it, and then it just won't grow. So you, you've got to be balancing this. So this is, you know, another thing to take in, into account. And also, if you're designing DNA with multiple genes, there's a lot of, like, quality of life stuff that you, you really want to include to make physically working with the DNA easier. Because if you ever need to make a change, there's nothing more annoying than having, a, you know, spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to have DNA printed, like a huge piece of DNA printed, and then realizing you have no easy way of fixing it because there's an error. So there's, like I say, there's a lot of quality of life stuff that you got to do. So yeah, generally, if you're working with uh, plasmids, um, 
in the range of like 5,000 to 8,000 base pairs is, is like really comfy. Um, any more than that, you're getting into the, like the, the weirdness. Um, lower than that is fine. But, um, and, and, you know, I've worked with some really, really tiny plasmids. But at the same time, you know, it varies. Just a thing to be, be aware of. Okay. Um, so just, just quickly, here's some very important words that you're going to hear me say a bazillion times uh, as we get into the, the code. And also, they're just important words to know if you're reading papers or you're trying to understand this stuff. So a backbone is generally an empty plasmid. Uh, it's, it's a plasmid you're going to put a gene into or a piece of DNA into. Um, it's, it's the blank CD, right? Vector, same as backbone. They're, these words are used in, uh, interchangeably. I tend to prefer backbone. Vector always feels weird um, because with, with a backbone, it, the, it implies that you're keeping most of the, the thing there. This is totally personal, personal preference. This makes no difference. I just prefer backbone. Um, insert is generally the thing you're going to be, well, inserting, right? It's the bit of code you're going to put into the backbone. Again, very helpful. Uh, MCS stands for multiple cloning site, and I'll show you what one of these looks like in a second. But basically, this is a, a, a bit in the plasmid where the person who made that plasmid has specifically put a bunch of restriction sites so that it's very, very, very easy to stick DNA in that location. So they, they put a bunch of different restriction sites, so you have lots of different uh, choices based on which enzymes you happen to own or which ones are compatible with your specific piece of DNA. And it's just, it's one of those quality of life things, right? Like it's, it's there to help um, uh, basically work with the DNA. Uh, a restriction site is a specific uh, piece of code where in, in nature, uh, we've found hundreds of different enzymes that will cut DNA at a very specific location. So generally, they'll target in the range of six to eight letters, like six to eight letters long. Um, and if that sequence of six or eight letters is present and you add the, the enzyme to a tube of that DNA, it will always cut the DNA at exactly that location in exactly the same way every single time. And this is one of the ways that we actually handle DNA. So you can make two cuts at two different locations in a backbone, and now you've got basically an empty hole where you can stick an insert. And, and you'll see what this looks like in a second. But this is, this is what a restriction site is and a restriction enzyme. They're sort of the bread and butter of your, your basic DNA handling. There are different ways to handle DNA, but knowing how restriction sites and restriction enzymes work is super important because also just for DNA analysis, you can use uh, restriction enzymes. So uh, when we get to looking at the code in just a moment, you'll see that all of these, all the code is full of restriction sites. Right? Some, are, some are just naturally there, like just because, you know, DNA is just an assemblage of letters. You never really know. Sometimes you'll just end up with a convenient restriction site somewhere. When you're designing DNA and you're testing DNA in the lab, one of the ways you can test to see if you put all the pieces together correctly is you can do what's called a restriction digest. So you can pick a few specific restriction enzymes, mix them in with your DNA, and have it cut the DNA into small fragments of expected sizes. Uh, and I'll show you what this looks like in a second. And then you take that DNA mixture and you run it on a gel and it'll separate the DNA into a series of bands. And if the bands are the right size, like they show up on the gel in the right order and in the right, at, and they're the right sizes, then you can already have an idea that you've put your DNA together correctly. So, you know, this is very, it's a very helpful thing to know. Um, the last thing is back translation. So, some sites and, and some resources don't provide the sequence of a protein as DNA. They, seek, they send you the sequence of a protein as, well, the sequence of the protein, just literally a bunch of amino letters. Um, and you can then take those amino letters and convert it back into DNA, hence back translation, for whatever organism you plan on putting it into. So if you're going to put an... Let, let's say you're taking a protein out of a plant and you want to put it into an E. coli. Generally, the way that the plant writes the DNA and the way that E. coli expects the DNA to be written is different. So what's, what you generally do, rather than copying the DNA directly and just sticking it over, you'll copy the amino sequence 
And I'll show you how this works. Uh, you copy the amino sequence, and then you back translate it back into DNA specific for E. coli or, or whatever it is you're doing. So this is a very, 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 yeah. So it's like, it's like decompiling and recompiling your code, essentially. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, you convert into one for, uh, format and then back into another that is corrected for the organism you're working with. So here's some other really good resources. Um, if you're starting your design, um, Ad Gene is fantastic. Um, they're very picky about who they actually sell DNA to. And for that, I dislike them immensely. However, they are a fantastic repository of code. So if you're, if you, even if they won't let you buy code from them, anybody can just go on AdGene and download DNA code of, you know. So if, if a, a scientist writes a paper and they've designed some DNA, sometimes they'll submit it to AdGene so that other researchers can just very quickly get a copy of that DNA and use it in their own research. Part of this is you submit the, like a, a data file of the, ex like every letter of your code that's hopefully annotated. So that way you can see what all of their code does and you can actually go in and work with it. So if you're, if you're starting a design, a lot of the time you'll find stuff on AdGene, which you can copy out and then use in your own work. Um, and if you're a nonprofit or you have, or are in like an educational institution, they'll just, they'll, they'll actually send you the physical DNA. Although I, I find this sort of ridiculous that they're like this, but I mean, whatever. Um, the next one is iGEM, specifically uh, BioBricks. Um, iGEM hosts, uh, iGEM is a, a, a genetic engineering competition that happens every year. And as a standard, every team that competes has to submit all the DNA that they used um, and all of the parts. And they, they've, they're really good about standardizing the genetic parts that they make. So, for example, they'll have a whole catalog of just promoters. So you can look through their catalog of promoters, find one that does the thing that you want, and then the code is available. You can just copy it and use it in your thing. Um, or it could be proteins or terminators or whatever. Um, iGEM is fantastic for that. And then the last one, of course, is SciHub. SciHub is amazing. It gives you access to every paper ever written for free, as it should be. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're, ever, if you're ever looking for, you know, a paper... Use Sci-Hub, you know, fuck else over here. Um, so yeah, basically a lot of, like, the, for example, when I'm, when I'm trying to design something or I want to, I want to do something genetically, I'll always start by finding papers, reading through them, seeing what other researchers have done. Then maybe if I'm lucky, I'll be able to find their code on AdGene, or maybe they're just, you know, posted in their supplementary of the paper. Um, and then from there, you can start going in and, and messing with the DNA. But these are all great resources to start with. Alrighty, enough talk. It's time to cook. Um, so yeah, we're uh, this is this is kind of the basics. Like I say, this this presentation is available in the GitHub link in the description. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's let's get into it and uh, actually start doing some some DNA design. So. Um, just quickly before we get into this, uh, I'm going to take a little time to just uh, answer some questions and, uh, uh, you know, um, see, so, you know, how's everybody, uh, how's everybody feeling about this? How's, uh, is, has all this made sense so far? And, uh, uh, yeah, and Jonah, if you can uh, send me the list of questions, that would be good. Um, but yeah. So, uh, how, how are we doing? How's everybody doing? You, 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 you liking the stream so far? <laughs> Jesse, we need to cook. All right. I got my list of questions. I'm going to just... Uh, bum, 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 bum. Okay, uh, a couple... Uh, just We're going to do a couple of questions, and then we're going to get into the code. Um, among all of your projects, what are the th top three causes of failure of plasmid incorporation into the host DNA? Um, the, the biggest reasons are you did something wrong. Um, either you physically mishandled it in the lab, you didn't include something in the DNA that you're supposed to, or you grabbed the wrong antibiotic and, um, well, I mean, that's always sad. There's, there's nothing worse than you, you do a transformation, you, uh, you know, you go through all the trouble of mixing the DNA with your bacteria, doing the whole thing to get the DNA in there and then you plate it on the wrong plate. 
So this has happened a lot of times because the, the DNA that I use in my lab fairly regularly, we have some combination of plasmids. Some of them use canamycin as their antibiotic. Some of the, them use ampicillin. And every now and again, you're not paying attention and you grab the wrong one. And, you know, you, you come in the next day expecting to see a plate full of colonies and it's just, it's just empty. And you're, you know, you're going, did, what did I do wrong? You know, did I, did I mess something up? And then you, then you look at the plate and go, this is a canamycin plate. This DNA works on ampicillin. Shit. Um, and, you know, then you got to just redo it, which is really annoying. But yeah, a lot of the time it's, it's user error is, is the big one. Um, could you, in theory, make a compiler? No. There's, there's, you know, I get this question a lot. There are too many pieces in biology that you could ever hope to simulate it. It's, it's just the reality. The, it, this is one of, like, biology is the most, if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong field of science, right? Like, you, you cannot make a compiler. In, in, a, in an E. coli alone, there are literally billions of pieces um, that all need to be simulated in order to make a, a compiler. It, it'll never happen. Like, it, like, supercomputers have to be unbelievably gigantic to even simulate some small fraction of it. Like, even just simulating a single protein can take, you know, half hour, 45 minutes just to generate the structure of one protein, not counting all of the interactions with every water molecule and atom and electron in the entire E. coli. It's just not going to happen. So the only way that, really the only way to do anything in biology is to just do as much research as you can in advance and really think it through and make sure you've you've checked everything you can, you know, every I is dotted, every T is crossed uh, before you order anything and then test it. And, and that's the only way you're really going to know if it works because you, you, you just can't make a compiler. Um, are unicellular organisms simpler than multicellular animals? Define simple, right? You know, like simple how? I, I So I'm a bit of a shithead. Right? This is this is should not be a surprise to, to most of you. But when I was in university, I took great pleasure in messing with my professors, which is why they didn't like me very much. Um, but you know, there was a there was a specific lecture that I was in where it was it was like an intro to bio lecture. This was not like some high level thing. And, you know, the professor is, is talking about how, you know, all organisms age. And, you know, then I, you know, sheepishly sheepishly raise my hand, I go well, what about lobsters? Lobsters are, are functionally immortal. And he goes, well, you know, lobsters are simpler organisms. I'm like, their DNA is four times larger than ours. And I go, he goes, oh, right? Like, so there can be single cellular uh, creatures that have DNA that dwarfs the human genome, right? Like, I, off the top of my head, I can think of a couple of unicellular uh, protists and, and other weird amoebas and stuff that can have thousands of times more genes than humans do. Because um, if you think about it, while a multicellular organism needs to have a lot of genes to like keep all everything functioning, we get away with the fact that we can like get up and move and walk away. And where, whereas like, if you compare like an animal to a plant, plants almost universally have more complex DNA than an animal does. Because an animal, if it has a problem, it can get up and go deal with it. Whereas a plant is a plant. Can't go anywhere. So it has to have all of the instructions for every niche case of weirdness that can happen to it, um, like coded and, and hard coded in, in case something weird happens. Um, okay, I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to answer the rest of these um, after we do the, the, coding, the coding stuff. Um, uh, okay, actually, this is, we just got a, a question that I'm going to answer really quickly. Do you know how strictly bioengineering is regulated in Europe? Is it possible to get into it when you're not in the U.S.? Uh, fairly. Um, like, it's absurd. Like, in, in Europe, it is, like, the most smooth brain idea of what genetic engineering should be. Like, you need a license to even make an E. coli express GFP, and they will absolutely throw the book at you if you do not have that license. But this, this actually brings up a really important point and it, it's something that I'm not going to dwell on too much but you know biology is not really a hobbyist game it's very expensive there's a there can be a lot of legislation around who can do it and you know what is required of their lab and their facilities in order to be allowed to do it um, you know most companies won't sell you any of the reagents um, if you are not 
like if you don't have a, a registered business and a registered business address. So if you're going to be doing this, you all, you have to take it kind fairly seriously. Like you can't really do this in your bedroom. It's, it's not a thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who will try and sell you the idea that you can just do this in your kitchen table and like, yeah, it's technically possible, but I, I've, I've basically come to the, the metaphor of if somebody asked me, should I go in, should I try and do biology or genetic engineering at home? My answer is always no. For the same reason that if you ask a war correspondent, is it a good idea to be a war correspondent and should I do this? Their answer will also always be no. Because if me saying that is enough to dissuade you from the fact that biology is unbelievably difficult, you'll spend most of your time crying, it's ungodly expensive. Um, if that's enough to dissuade you from doing it, you're probably not going to make a very good biologist. Like, it's brutal to do this stuff. Like, you'll, you'll spend thousands and thousands of dollars on DNA and reagents and stuff. You'll spend months working on something and it won't work and there's no compiler and there's no way for you to know why it's not working. But then it does sometimes. Um, and that moment of it suddenly works is amazing. And I know I know this puts this puts a lot of cold water on, on the idea of this, but part of the reason I'm doing this these streams and I, I do hope to write all of this into a book at some point is because even though biology is very expensive and even though it is ungodly difficult, it's so much fun. Like being able to, to recode life casually to do whatever you want is amazing. And the price of these things is coming down. But keep in mind, the first time somebody did this was 30 years ago. This is not like an, an old subject. Like we've only been doing this for, for practically the blink of an eye. So... You know, it, it's not the sort of thing where it's particularly feasible now. But I, I like teaching this stuff, A, because it hopefully it'll help people who are in um, university and who have access to the resources to do this properly. Um, because, you know, having I now have years of this under my belt, so I can hopefully give some tips and tricks and stuff on um, uh how to do this better than what academics will teach you because they teach you how to do this in just some of the dumbest ways possible. But also I, I hope that future generations and, and as time goes on, the price of doing this will come down. It will be more open and available to the masses. And so that's sort of why I'm doing this, right? Like it's, I, I hope it's to help get people excited enough that they go to university and they, they do this. Or maybe you're in university and you want to do this as do some of this as one, your thesis or something. Like that that's really why I'm doing this. The idea that you can do this in your kitchen, to be fair, is possible. I did a lot of genetic engineering in my kitchen. Um, I am also insane. Um, and have like I'm a level of stubborn that is really hard to put into words. Um, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly, like, you, and you have to be for, for, to be a good biologist, everything will fail a million times. So like, you have to be able to just take failure to the face as if, you know, you, like you gotta be a little bit of a masochist, right? Like you're like, everything will just fail and fail and fail and fail and fail. And you gotta just be okay with that because it's going to happen and you've got to be ready for it. But then things do work eventually if you just keep at it. So, you know, it, it's it's an important thing to keep in mind. But uh, anyway, um, so we're in stream projects and genetic engineering. Okay, let's actually get into some code. Um, <laughs> if we are just insane, can we do it in our kitchen? Yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, again, you gotta be you gotta be kind of nuts. And also, it's it's really important that you have a stream of income that can afford it because biology is ridiculously expensive. And like I, I, one of the things that really kills me is um, places like the Odin and the fuckers who run it um, try and sell you this idea that if you just buy enough of their kits, you can just do genetic engineering. It's not true. It's, it's just not, right? Like doing genetic engineering is so expensive. Everything you do is expensive. The, 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 Equipment is expensive. The reagents are expensive. Printing DNA is expensive. Your time is expensive. Like, it's, it's, it's all expensive. So, like, you know, um, I really, yeah, the best biologists are masochists. You heard it first. Yeah, it's true. They are. Because um, you have to be. 
But anyway, so all, all that kind of negativity aside, it is. I still think it's worth it. Like if if you're the right kind of crazy, I think that it's legitimately worth it, and it's some of the most fun that I've ever had. And it, it like the the things that we do kind of casually, and the things that you're going to see on this channel over the next year are frankly bonkers. But you, you got to remember that the reason I'm able to do them is because of the years and years and years of failure and suffering it took to get at, good at it. Um, and, you know, so, so that's just sort of the way it is. Okay, Let, let's get into some, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, get into some coding. Um, this uh, program that you're looking at here, this website is called Benchling. Um, I particularly like this one because it's free. Um, and the amount of functionality that's built in is pretty significant. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm not, this is not sponsored, although if they'd like to sponsor me, hit me up. That sounds great. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's a fantastic tool. And this is really where I do all of my coding uh, of uh, DNA and, and this kind of thing. So, um, oh, now you see the mouse. Outstanding. That's, that's fun. That's just super fun. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, this is where we're going to be doing all of our DNA coding. So to start off, we need a backbone. We need something to put our DNA into. Now, when it comes to picking a backbone, again, we're, we're, you're, you're got to take into account all of those different things that I talked about earlier, which is, you know, what antibiotic are you going to be using? Is it constitutive? Is it uh, inducible? Is it high copy? Is it low copy? Whatever the case may be. So if you're having trouble picking a backbone, um, uh, GeneScript here um, is, oh, come on, go away, um, is a really great resource for this. Um, GeneScript or GenScript is the, the company that I, I use for all of my DNA printing. Again, not sponsored. I just really like their service because they're very, very good at what they do. Um, and something that's very helpful is uh, this list, which is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll post a, a link to it um, in, the, in the GitHub or something. Um, but uh, basically, these are all of the backbones that they just have in stock. Um, if you happen to have a different backbone that you want to use, you can send them a sample and they'll input it and they'll save it for you for up to five years. Uh, or if you keep using it, they, that, you know, that timer gets reset. Um, and you can also just tell them, like, I still need this, don't throw it out. But if you, So if you've got your own, you can send it to them, but these are all the ones that they just have available for you to use. So if we're talking bacteria, right... Um, this is sort of the, the, long, the long list here of different bacterial backbones that you can use. The one that I particularly like is uh, PET28A. Um, you know, each of these have their, their quirks, um, but we're going to use PET28A. So if you click on it, it'll bring you to this page, which gives you a sort of map um, of what PET28 has in it. Right? So if you look at it, remember how I said that, you know, the, in the, the DNA glyphs, like what these things look like, you know, this is generally the notation that you'll see in plasmids for different chunks, right? So if you see can R, as a rule, anything that ends in a big capital R means it's the resistance gene. So if it says can, that's canamycin. So we know that this is a canamycin resistant, uh, will, will provide the E. coli canamycin resistance. Um, you'll see there's an MCS here, multiple cloning site, and then it lists all these different restriction enzymes. That's what these are, by the way. These uh, these little weird uh, codes um, are different restriction enzymes. So if you go on to like Thermo Fisher uh, or any of the other major suppliers and you type in EcoRI, you can just buy a tube of this stuff. Um, the other thing you'll see is it's got the PBMR32 or uh, 32-2 uh, ORI. Um, this is a low copy ORI. Um, it's it. There looks like there's a void here, but there's actually other code here. It's just not annotated. Um, there's there's other the other code that's in here interacts with this particular ORI to maintain this plasmid as low copy. Um, the other thing that's in here uh, and that's really important is this thing that says lack one uh, or lack I, depending on on how you want to pronounce it. Um, so this plasmid is built to be inducible. We're going to break the inducible part 
later when we get into the uh, as we get into the coding because I don't want this to be inducible, but I wanted to show you what inducible code looks like. So this protein is constitutive, right? So this is on a promoter that is constitutive. So this protein is always being produced. This protein can actually detect lactose. So if lactose is, so it, it binds to, do you see how this says lac O? And here, I'm gonna go back to the code so you can just see this. Um, this is lac O, this is the lac operator, right? So that protein, this, this, lac, this lac I protein, physically binds to the lac operator here and basically prevents the DNA from being read. Um, oh, thank you, Henrik. Um, so the, the lac operator physically prevents the DNA from being read. But when lactose is present, the protein will actually pop off the DNA and the regular DNA reading mechanism can, keep, can actually like, read and do its thing. Um, the other thing you'll see here is the T7 promoter. You can see how tiny this is. T7 is a viral promoter, so it comes out of the T7 uh, bacteriophage. It's very, very small, and it's very strong. So if I were to get rid of the LAC operator, right, like if I were to delete this bit, this bit of code, all of a sudden, um, uh, this, this gene becomes constitutive. Because without this LAC operator and without this LAC1 protein, there's nothing to stop the, the DNA from running. And this T7 promoter will run like crazy. It is very, 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 very strong, um, which is the reason why a lot of people use it. But, uh, you know, it, it also has its drawbacks. Um, because it's a viral promoter, it requires a viral protein to be read. Um, so when you're buying E. coli, there's all kinds of different strains that you can buy. One of them is called BL21. And there's a whole set of derivative ones of BL, like the BL21 derivatives. The thing that makes BL21 special is that it has been engineered to express the special protein that interacts with the T7 promoter. So if you want to make an absolute ridiculous amount of protein, a really easy way to do it is you choose BL21 as your strain and you use the, T the T7 promoter because it's very strong and with that machinery, it'll actually let you do the thing. Um, the other thing to, to see in P21... Oh, and also... Uh, another thing to mention to actually get this code, right? Like I have it load. I've already I've taken the the liberty of loading all of this code into uh, the the program in advance. But if you actually need to get a copy of PET twenty eight A, you can just Google it. Um, and this is this is a site called Snapgene.com. They they have a repository of different uh, bits of DNA. So this is again this is PET twenty eight. Um, you just download it. So you just click download plasmid. And then in Benchling, you can just go to, you hit the plus, and then you go DNA, RNA, and then you go import. Um, and if you do that, it lets you, you know, pick a file and, and import the, the thing. Oh, Michael, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it, man. Um, so, yeah. Um, so if you need this code, that's, that's a great place to get it. So we now have our backbone, right? We're going we're gonna to use this backbone, PET28A. What are we going to put in here? We're going to put this stuff in there. So these are different fluorescent proteins. Um, the one we're going to be using is called FUGFP or FUGFP, uh, which is hilarious because that stands for fair use. But the, the story of FUGFP is kind of hilarious. Um, so this other protein right here, SFGOP, uh, GFP, not GOP. Oh, my God. <laughs> the GOP protein. It makes you have really bad politics. No, um, no, uh, SF, uh, G GFP or superfolder GFP is a very bright, uh, GFP that matures very, very quickly. Um, so when the protein is expressed, it goes from being a noodle of, of unfolded protein to mature fluorescent protein very quickly. Um, the thing is superfolder GFP is patented and the people who own the patent are dicks. So what the people who, uh, created, uh, FUGFP did was they took the code for superfolder GFP and they mutated it randomly uh, to do two things. Uh, one, they they randomly mutated it and selected colonies until they eventually had uh, a bit of DNA that was only uh, and a protein that was less than eighty percent similar to superfolder GFP. Because in patent law, generally they only let you claim ownership of a protein 
within about 80%. So if you change 20% of the letters, you don't get to say that it's yours anymore. So what the Fuji FP people did, um, which I think it might be the ND lab, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but um, what, what they did was they basically purposely mutated Superfolder GFP until they had a protein that was just as bright or if not brighter outside of the 80% range and folded just as quickly if not faster than Superfolder GFP and then released it as public domain for anybody to use. Um, so the, the FU is fair use, but it's also a bit of a, you know, thumb in their nose at, uh, at, at the original authors. So I, I kind of love that. It's kind of amazing. Um, so, you know, it's kind of fair use, but it's also fuck you. Um, but anyway, so we're going to be using Fuji FP. Um, so if you want to find Fuji FP, we're going to use AdGene because they posted it to AdGene so that anybody theoretically can get the code. Um, so this is the, the Fuji FP plasmid. So on AdGene, right, you can just search like Fuji FP in the search bar and then you'll find this. And when you come to this, uh, this page, you just click on the, the plasmid map and it gives you a, a, a picture of the map. And then you just click GeneBank or SnapGene, doesn't matter which, both work. Um, and there, uh, then that, that'll download. And then you go into Benchling and you load it into your project folder, right? So I, I've done that. It's right here. Now, something I did in advance of the stream, because when I first imported it, uh, the, unfortunately, the, if we look at AdGene, right? So you'll see that there's these big arrows that mark, you know, known features, uh, when they submitted this, they did what I call the cardinal sin of genetic engineering, which is they didn't fucking annotate their code, which is, there's nothing more annoying than this. Always annotate your frickin' code. Like, if I if it's not annotated, I can't use it, and they're, then, therefore it's useless. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, it, it wasn't annotated. However, because I know that every protein always starts with ATG, and one thing that was annotated was the promoter, I know that somewhere after this promoter, there's going to be an ATG. And you'll, you'll notice that if you, if you were to look through this, right, there is no ATG until right here. So I, I had a suspicion that this is where the, the protein started. So what I did was I just, I clicked there, and then I, I sort of scrolled until I found... Um, something that looked vaguely like a Terminator. Unfortunately, Terminator also not annotated. These people, man. I mean, they, they, make, they, they make good proteins, but they don't annotate, annotate their code, and that's really annoying. So basically what I did was I just sort of like scrolled until I saw any other annotation, and then I just held shift and clicked, and then right-click and go create translation, and then forward. Um, and then a little pop-up will pop up over here. Uh, my, my head's in the way, but underneath my head, there's a save button. Uh, when you click save, it'll, it'll make a translation. So uh, you'll see that all of the code is consistent, right? Like there's, there's, it's nice letters all the way down. Um, so you can kind of scroll and scroll and scroll. And then you'll see these stars. The stars are stop codons. So from there, I knew that the Fuji FP protein sequence starts at the ATG up here. And it goes until these stop codons. So I knew that that's the actual sequence that I care about. Um, unfortunately, the rest of it isn't annotated, but that's okay because we're not going to be using their code. Um, the, one of the other ways that I was able to check this is I actually have Fuji FP in the lab. That, that image in the, uh, at the start of the presentation is my image. Like, I grew that. Um, also, if you guys have been watching the shorts, um, one of the newest shorts... Uh, I actually show putting some Fuji FP DNA into some E. coli and, and showing that process really quickly. Um, but the, the other reason I know I can double check this is because this is the, the plasma that I actually have. Um, I got this from a buddy of mine named uh, Sebastian, and I think his stuff is linked in the description. And if it, and if it isn't, then I'll be sure to do that. I'll also post this plasmid in the in the GitHub so you can see it. I got this plasmid from him. It's the uh, PIDM V5K. So in the same way that this is PET28A, um, the one that he designed is PIDM V5K. Um, 
So like I said, I have this piece of DNA. It has Fuji FP in it, and the Fuji FP is annotated because Sebastian is amazing, and he annotates his code. Um, so I was able to basically cross-check it, um, which is always super, super important. Um, so uh, basically, I, I did exactly the same thing. So I click on the annotation. I made a translation, and then I can look at the letters and then go back over here. And you know, so this says MVSSG, blah, 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 blah. So then I can go here, I scroll up, I go MVSSG, blah, 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 blah. So we know that it's, it's the correct thing. Um, um, for, for those who want to donate, uh, which is also super appreciated, um, you can either donate as a super chat, but it's also it's much better if you donate. There's a link in the description, um, and then you can uh, donate through there. It's greatly appreciated. It helps the show out. Um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, moving right along. Um, so... Now, now we know we have the code, right? Now we're gonna pretend for a second that this code was not written for E. coli. It was, but we're gonna pretend that it isn't. So instead of just hitting copy and copying the DNA directly, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna screw this up immediately. I'm, okay, so I'm gonna re, I can re-highlight that by just clicking on the annotation I made, right-clicking, and instead of hitting copy, I'm gonna hit copy special. I'm gonna go down to translation. So what this is going to do is instead of copying the DNA letters, it's going to copy all the amino sequence, right? Um, so I go copy special, translation, and then this little window pops up. You just click it, and now it's copied. Now we're going to open a new, and we're going to go to amino sequence, and we're going to go new amino acid sequence. And we're going to call it foo GFP, right? And we click create. So this gives us a, a blank a blank page. Just you know, click in the in this window and just control V. Uh, this little window pops up, click enter. And now we have the sequence of foo GFP. So you'll see this is all the, the different amino uh, letters. I can make this a little bigger so it's a little easier to see. Um, but yeah, these are all the different amino letters. Now, if we highlight the whole thing, uh, what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna do that back translation I'm gonna talk, I was talking about. So like I say, we're pretending that we didn't know what the original DNA this came from was written for. Maybe it was written for a plant. Maybe it was written for an animal. Um, but, um, you know, we don't know. It also doesn't matter because we have the amino sequence, and that's really the only thing we care about. So if I right-click and hit back translate, this window pops up. So remember how I talked about earlier that each organism has codons that it prefers? This is where this comes in. So you can pick the organism from the drop-down list here, and it's got a really, really long, long list, you know, depending on what you're doing. Maybe you're doing uh, Orzia sativa, maybe you're doing uh, Lactococcus, maybe you're doing uh, E. coli. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit E. coli K12 um, because that's a, it's very reasonable. Um, you can also pick E. coli uh, uh, 0157. This is, this is actually an infectious strain. Uh, K12 is closer to the lab strain, so I'm gonna click uh, K12. Now, uh, the GC content, um, just leave it at medium. Medium is fine. Um, generally, so GC content, if we just go back to um, this for a second, um, you'll see that, you know, the, the four DNA letters, A, G, C, T, will come up in, a, in different ratios. So if I click on, on Fuji FP, uh, right near the bottom, okay, it's kind of, it's almost cropped out, but, um, it's right, right down here, right under the underneath the donation bar. Um, you'll see GC fifty one percent. So that's a very middle of the road GC content. Generally, that's what you want. You don't want anything that's either way too low or way too high. Like in the range of of like thirty to sixty percent is fine. Anything more than that, and you can start running into issues where the DNA is physically more difficult to work with, and it, it just causes a headache. So you you generally want like a middle of the road uh, GC content. So like I said, you click medium. Um, for avoiding hairpins, basically what this is talking about is if you have a stretch of DNA, um, if you've got anything that's a little bit palindromic, um, you can actually have the DNA as it's unwound and being read stick back on itself. Or the RNA especially, especially the RNA, um, because it's single-stranded, can actually stick to itself um, and, and literally make a knot. Um, and, and basically the reason this is a problem is, is if you have a knot of RNA... 
it will literally clog up the machinery and you can just have no protein be made or very low amounts of protein being made. So getting rid of hairpins is generally good. So what this is looking for is looking for any hairpins that are like within a, a range of sizes. Again, I don't usually mess with these settings. The, the default is fine. Um, the last thing that we need to do is avoiding cut sites. So you remember we talked about um, restriction enzymes. So if we go to PET28, and also just so you know, this is, this is the PET28 like straight when you download it, but you'll notice that everything's pointing in the wrong direction, right? So the, the promoter is pointing to the left and then you've got the protein stuff up here. This is really annoying because I, I hate reading it up like this. It's just, it's deeply, deeply, deeply annoying. Um, so basically all I did to fix this was I went control A and instead of hitting copy, I hit copy special reverse complement. So the, the top line, right? The top, so it, it, DNA is double stranded, right? So it shows the top, the, the top strand and the bottom strand. Um, the, the, the bottom strand is the reverse complement. So uh, if you select the whole thing, um, it'll, it'll save all the annotations when you do this. So you don't need to worry about that. But if you select the whole thing and then hit reverse complement and then just make a new, like a new DNA sequence, like go do this and hit new DNA sequence and just paste it in, you'll now have it clockwise instead of counterclockwise. So now when you go back to this, it's all pointing in, in, a, in a convenient direction. So for example, the, the DNA I showed you before from Sebastian. Um, oh, nom nom. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. Um, so uh, this code is clockwise, like a sane person, because you know clockwise is just easier to read. So generally, if you can set your DNA to be clockwise, if it's if it's counterclockwise, it's just so awkward. Um, um, and we're going to talk about how to have this printed, by the way. So just to answer uh, Scaredy's uh, question. Uh, yes, all of this can be printed, and uh, I'm going to show you how to do that as we're as we're done coding this. But anyway, so if we look at, at PT28 that I've made clockwise, um, you'll see that there's all these restriction sites here, right? So NCOI is here. This is labeled ATG. So this is your start codon. This is this is going to be the start of our protein, um, and you see that it's got an NCOI. NCOI is a really really convenient. Uh, restriction enzyme because it has ATG built into it. So it's really good to stick at the start of things. If, if I look at Sebastian's plasmid, you can see there's an NCOI here for the same reason. It's just, it's really convenient. So anyway, I, I highly recommend leaving that alone. But then there's all these other restriction sites, most of which I don't want. Um, especially this, like having a, a his tag on the end can be a pain in the ass if sometimes. But so basically what you want to do is you, you want to pick your front so this is going to be the, the front side uh, where we're going to stick the protein in. And then you got to pick a, a, a rear restriction site because the way that we're going to tell the printing company to make this is you're going to give them two restriction sites and they're going to physically cut the DNA at those two sites um, and your printed piece is going to fit into that hole. So let's just for simplicity's sake here, we're going to pick HIN3, right? HIN3 hin right here. So we're going to say that this is the back. So we've, we need, the, the ones we need to remember are HIN3 and NCOI. The rest of this we can mostly ignore. Um, the other one we, we're going to want to remember is NDEI um, because some of this, and here, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight this just so you can, just so you can see it. Um, I'm going to create translation forward. Okay, so you can see that uh, there's, there's a thing here and it looks pretty weird. Um, so this this string of H's is called a his tag. Um, it's C six F six X his. So this is what I was talking about earlier. This is a very common tag that you'll add to a protein to make it very easy to extract uh, from E. coli. So you can grow the E. coli, um, and his tags are fantastic. So um, you you can grow the you can grow the E. coli, pop them open and then use the his tag to selectively extract out this protein and leave all the rest behind. Um, the other thing that's important is this thrombin site. I don't typically like thrombin as a, as a choice for this because it's difficult to remove and it, it comes with baggage. And you also, you can't make thrombin. The only way that you can get thrombin is to extract it from blood, uh, which, I mean, you can... You, this is not a thing you actually do in the lab. You you buy purified thrombin, but that's where it comes from. But it means you can't grow thrombin yourself, so you have to buy it. 
Um, what thrombin is, is it's a cleavage site. So if you add, so in the same way that if you add a restriction enzyme to a sample of DNA, it cuts DNA at a known location, thrombin is a protein cleavage site. So if you add thrombin to the finished protein, it will cut at a specific location, generally between the, the G and the S here. Um, so it'll, it'll cut right there. Um, so everything to the right uh, would stay is your, your protein of interest. Everything to the left could be removed. Um, but like I say, I don't like thrombin. We're going to leave it alone because I don't feel like changing this right now. Um, but because we're leaving the thrombin site here, it means we also need the restriction site that's right next to it. So that way, if we want, we could be inserting a new protein between these two restriction sites, right? So when we tell the printing company where to put our piece of DNA that they just printed, we're going to tell them NDI and HIND3. So anyway, that's that's that. So we go if we go back to FuGFP, uh, we can go add cut site to avoid, and you're going to cut type in NCOI, and then click it from and then select it from the list, and then you're going to type in HIND, and then HIND three comes up. So you're going to select it from the list, and you're going to select NDEI, uh, because those are the those are the ones that we want. So these are all the ones we want to make sure that it's going to make sure not to accidentally stick into our code. And then we hit preview optimization which uh, is unfortunately under my head. So you didn't, you didn't actually see me do that, but it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's literally like, well, right, it's right here um, on the screen. You just can't see it. Um, so it's optimizing, it's doing the thing. Okay, now it's done. So it tells you, okay, we've had to use a rare codon five times, but that's okay. That's a, that's a very reasonable number. The GC content is 49%, that's great. And there are 13 hairpins. That's also, this is all reasonable. This is, this is all a reasonable uh, thing. So again, the button is directly below where my mouse is and directly to the right of where my mouse is. So it's, it's basically where my face is. And you just click save as new sequence. And then you're going to say, uh, you know, you pick your, your thing. So I'm going to save it into the same folder. It, by default, it will save into the same folder that you're working from. And now we have this new sequence here that says FuGFP codon optimized. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do, because remember, annotate your code, is go control A and then create annotation. And you're going to give it a name, a nice descriptive name, FuGFP. And because it's green fluorescent protein, I'm going to color it green just because I can. So now we have our FuGFP code. Now, this has been now optimized for K12 E. coli, so this is perfect and ready to go into our backbone. So you can just click on the annotation. This is the other reason to annotate it. It makes copying stuff very easy. And you just go Control Copy. And now we go back over to PET28 clockwise, and we go NDI here. And we're going to want to stick her in. So if we, if we look at the NDI, um, I'm going to have to, hi so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on the H because this is the last complete codon. And then I'm going to go three, let three letters over. And you'll see that that completely, so when, when I mouse over NDI, it shows the letters that the enzyme recognizes, right? So it's the C-A-T-A-T-G, that, like that's the, the sequence that it recognizes. Um, so you, you can't mess with that. And so we're going to want to paste our code in after the G. We can't mess with this code. Um, although, because it's ATG, we actually kind of can. Because remember, if we look at FuGFP, the, the first letter is methionine. And if we look at our code, it's ATG. So this is actually really helpful. So we can go to PET28. We can highlight the ATG. And then we're going to go to HIND3. And we're going to go to just to the right of it. Or to the left of it, rather. So HIND3 is highlighted, but none of it, its code is about to get deleted when I paste this in. So at this point, we're ready, we're ready to paste the code in. So right click, uh, is it gonna, oh, never mind, screw it. Um, just Command V. Um, and now the little dialog thing pops up. You click Enter, and then you wait for a second for it to like sort itself out. And now we have FuGFP inserted into PET28 in such a way where it leaves this stuff this, this like leader sequence here alone, but now we have FuGFP. So what this has just done is not only is this DNA now going to make FuGFP, if you were to put it into E. coli, it's doing it in such a way where it's histagged. 
So not only does it make the Fuji FP, it's an extractable form of Fuji FP. And once the extraction procedure is finished, you can cut off this Hiss tag if you don't want it. So you can just add a little bit of thrombin and it'll cut right here. And the only extra that it'll have on the Fuji FP is an S and an H, which is, is fine. It doesn't affect anything. Um, S is inert and H in this, in, in this location generally doesn't do anything. Um, so yeah, uh, this, we've, now, we've now done that. Now we want to make sure that our translation is good. So we click on the M and then we go to the end of the Fuji FP and we go and we just highlight a little extra and we go make translation. So right click, create translation, forward. Um, again, I mean, the color doesn't matter. So I'm just going to save. And now we have a translation. Now, something you're going to notice is there's no stop code on, which is bad because we, we, we need to have a stop code on. So this S is the end, and we can, we can cross check this, right? So we know that KS are the last two uh, aminos of the sequence. So we want a stop code on after that word. So go KS, so we need stop code on here. So while the, the cursor is right here without clicking anything, we just, we just start typing. And I'm going to go T-A-A, T-A-G, T-A-A. It's three stop codons. It guarantees that the thing stops. And the reason you want this is because if this if there's read through, like if the stop codon doesn't work, this extra hiss tag is going to remain stuck to your food, food GFP, and that's not good. So you don't want that. Um, so yeah, now we've now we've got food GFP. It's it's stopped properly. Um, you'll see there's a terminator here because this code is actually annotated properly. So we ha we have a terminator. So this is now. A, a, theoretically, it's a perfectly functional bit of code. Like you could you could have this ordered and this would work. Um, I know that because I basically I have this in my fridge and it, and it does work. Um, so the the last thing to do uh, before you do anything else is you've got to give this a good name. Other, because when you get coding a lot of DNA, if you don't label your stuff, it gets lost and then you have no idea what anything is anymore. Um, so I'm gonna make this a little bigger just so you can. So also there's a zoom function here. So if you want to like zoom in on stuff, you can do that. Again, my, my face is over most of it. So I'm going to zoom back out so you can see the whole ring. Um, but yeah, so you got to give this a name. So you just right click on the on the file, you click rename. And so now I'm going to call this PT28 FuGFP. So now I know this file is FuGFP stuck into PT28, which is, which is always great. So, um, that, and, this, and this is basically as, as much as you got to do. However, there is, there is a couple more changes that I want to do. So remember how I said uh, PT28 is uh, inducible? It's specifically, it's lack inducible because we've got the lack operon here and the lack uh, um, inducer or the, like the lack I protein here. Let's say, for example, that we don't want this. So, so right now, if we were to stick this into E. coli, and we don't add lactose to the media, nothing's gonna happen. Like you'll, you'll have like beige colonies on your plate, but there'll be no glow because if there's no lactose, this gene doesn't turn on. Let's say that we want this to be constitutive instead of inducible. What we can do is we can just delete this, just, just straight up, we can just delete it. Um, the, the way that we can do that is so you see there's a restriction site up here called bigly uh, bigly2 or bgli or bglii um, i just i call it bigly cuz it's you know it's fun um, as long as we have a restriction site it means that we can get rid of code um, because if there's no restriction site there's no there's like the way that you insert code is just a freaking nightmare um, because then you got to do PCR and, and Gibson and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to, we're, but we have a restriction site here, so we can actually make this change. So let's say we don't even want to use T7. We want this, we want this piece of DNA to work in any strain of E. coli. You know, not BL21, nothing fancy. This will work in anything. So what we can do is I'm going to go over to here because I have a promoter that I want to use. Um, and like I say, I'm going to, I'm going to include this piece of DNA in the GitHub. This comes from Sebastian, full credit to him. This is his design. Um, but, uh, so his, his plasmid uses a different promoter. Uh, it's the, the J23100, uh, like J23100 promoter. Uh, it's a reasonably strong promoter. It's constitutive, nothing messes with it. Um, and it's very easy to print. 
So I'm actually going to highlight this whole thing, like all the way up to uh, the, the NCOI, right? So we've got NCOI here. So I'm going to just click right next to it so we're not copying it. Uh, there's a ribosome binding site. This is a, a very good ribosome binding site and it's annotated. So we're going we're gonna to copy that as well. And we're going to copy this promoter right, right up to there. Um, we also removed the ECORI site um, in PT28. So if we look at PT28, um, the multiple cloning site here had ECORI, but when we stuck FUGFP in, into PT28, we, we deleted it. Um, so on the, on the right-hand side here, uh, which I realize is cropped out of frame. Sorry about that. Um, there's a there's a menu which, if you click it, it, it looks like a pair of scissors. Um, this is the digest menu, um, and this is for working with the restriction sites. If I type in ecori, um, you'll see that ecori has a zero next to it, which means that there are no instances of ecori in this plasmid. Um, so this means that we were free to use it. We can, we can stick it in there and we're not going to be worried about it accidentally cutting somewhere where we're not expecting. So if I go back to, um, Sebastian's plasmid, I'm going to copy this whole front bit all the way from ecori to NCOI, not highlighting the NCOI bit. So again, I'm going to click, I'm going to click copy just the whole thing. And then we're going to go over to the PT28 Fuji FP. We're going to go past bigly right past the BGLII start right about here. I like to leave a little bit of breathing room because you know, why not? Um, our NCOI is here. We're going to hold shift and I'm going to click just to the left of it, making sure that none of the NCOI is highlighted. And I am going to go command V and paste that code in there. And then it's going to, you know, have a fit for a second and then it'll figure itself out. Um, what we've now done is, I mean, the, it, you know, it kind of, defeats the purpose of using PET28 because we don't need this lack inducible thing anymore. Um, but I wanted to show what it, what it looks like. And, and PET28 is, it's a good backbone generally. Um, but anyway, so we've, we've now taken an inducible plasmid and turned it into a, a constitutive one. So this DNA will now just run constantly. And the reason that I made sure to copy this ecori is if we ever wanted to change this promoter, if we wanted to say go to either a different inducible one or maybe a stronger or weaker promoter for whatever reason, you could cut with ecori and NCOI and remove this whole fragment, print a new piece and stick it in this hole. And now you've got um, a new thing that does something different. But for right now, this is fine. So basically if we wanted to have this made, right? We need to tell, we basically need to have from here, because from Bigly, all the way to Hind3 printed. Because everything else, everything that's not highlighted right now is built in. Like it, it's, it comes in the DNA already. You don't need to have this printed. So the only bit that we need to print is this little piece, which is a length of 808 or eight, uh, 881 base pairs. So 881 letters long. Now we're going to copy this. Um, now, uh, I, I refresh, I'm going to just set this to just camera for a second, just cause I, I need to log into my account. Otherwise it, it's going to throw a fit. Um, oh good. It's already done the thing. Okay. So I don't, I don't actually need to do that. Okay, great. I'm going back. Okay. Back to the scene. Um, so this is the company that I use for DNA printing. Again, this is not sponsored. This is, uh, um, I just like their services. They, they just do a really good job. I, I wish they would sponsor me. If anybody from the company is watching and you want to sponsor me, send me an email. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so GeneScript. We're going we're gonna to go through the example of using this company to have DNA printed. We're not going to go through the whole process. We're just going to go through some of it. Um, so if you go to GeneScript or GenScript.com um, and you go to reagent services and then down to molecular biology and then gene synthesis, uh, it'll bring you to this page. Um, you can see that they have different services depending on what you're doing. Um, I like to use the fast service. It's more expensive, but I find that it's worth it um, because then it shows up in like a week, which is lovely. Um, then you click quote or order and it brings you up to this page, right? So if we go back to um, our, our DNA that we just wrote, um, we've, we've copied this already, but um, we've got to make sure that when we, when we copy this, we have to make sure that the restriction site, the whole, the whole restriction site is highlighted. Like the, the, um, cause if you're missing even a letter, this won't work. 
So you, you, you mouse over hin three, make sure that the whole thing is highlighted. You go to the top, you go to Bigly, you make sure all of Bigly is highlighted, you copy it, and then you go over to the gene script order. Under gene sequence, under gene sequence, you print it, or you just click paste and, and paste it in here. Um, and then you got to give it a name. So generally, right, when I'm, when I'm doing DNA, because I make so many different pieces of DNA, um, just giving it a name like PT28 Fuji FP is not actually sufficient. So generally what I'll do is I'll give it a pair of letters and then a, a, a number. So let's say it's uh, TE for Thought Emporium. Um, I'm on, right now off the top of my head, I know that I'm on number 15. So, so 015, right? So I know that this is Thought Emporium piece number 15. Because again, I have hundreds of pieces of DNA in my freezer. So I've got I've to have a numbering system to keep all this stuff straight. And then I'll have the name so that I know what it is. But this, this number is the most important part. So on, on GeneScript, uh, a lot of the times, rather than putting the, the name of the thing, I'll put, you know, T015. But in this case, I'll also write FUGFP, just so it's, it's really nice and clear. Uh, then we click Continue. And then it'll bring us to this, um, this page here, where basically this is asking, okay, now what do you want us to do with this? Where do you want us to put this, right? So um, first things first, let's deal with our restriction size, uh, restriction enzymes. That's what these two boxes here are. RE is restriction enzyme. So in DNA, right, um, the, the front, right, like the, the, the start of the sequence um, is the five prime side. Um, the, the end is the three prime. So DNA is always read five prime to three prime. So what it's asking for on this page is what's the enzyme at the front? So in this case, we know it's Bigly. Uh, so B G L I I, and that should come up, but it's not. I don't know why, why is it not coming up. B G what? Do they not have Bigly? Oh, B G L I I. Oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, okay. Um, hmm. That's really annoying. Uh, SGR AI. Let's see if they've got that one. SGR. No, they don't. Why, is it, why do they not have Bigly? Wow, that's really frustrating. Okay, well, they don't have Bigly. So that, that puts a crater into that plan. Um, and they don't seem to have SGR AI either. Yeah, no, they don't. They don't have it. Okay, that's annoying. So we're gonna have to make an adjustment. See, this is this is the thing. You do this, and then sometimes you find out and that you're wrong. <laughs> so, um, okay, there's a, so they didn't have Bigly. They don't have SGRAI. Maybe they have SPHI. So let's try SPHI. Um, SPHI. They have S SPHI. So now we actually have to go back and and tweak our gene sequence a little bit. So instead of uh, highlighting from Bigly to HIN3, we need to highlight from SPHI. So I go SPHI, make sure the whole thing is highlighted. Go to HIN3, make sure the whole thing is highlighted. Copy it again. Go back to here, gene sequence. Uh, I'm gonna just go Control A and then paste it. Paste it again, replace. So now, now it's that whole, it's the whole thing, right? So we've got SPHI and HIN3. Um, it's really annoying. I think they detect. Do they do they detect it? Yeah, they 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 do detect uh, BGLII. Um, just for some reason, they wouldn't let us uh, use that as a restriction site. Not entirely sure why. Um, this should update in a second. I don't know why it hasn't. Um, close. Okay, there we go. Um, so this has now been updated. Um, so now if we go, uh, so SPHI is is highlighted. This one is going to be. If I go hind and they've got hind three, so they've got it. So now we've got our five prime enzyme and our three prime enzyme. And we need to tell them which vector, like which backbone this thing is going into. So if we click this, uh, we can go P, E, T. And then if we scroll through the list, we'll find 28A. It's right here. And as soon as you do that, this should all, that's weird. It says it's not the vector. That's odd because it, Absolutely is. Um, very weird. Very, very weird. Um, not sure why it's doing this. It's being a little uh, 
being a little frustrating. Um, but anyway, so it, it, I think I think you get the point, really. Um, you you kind of have to just futz with it un, until you have um, basically what you want. Um, if we go, uh, if okay, let's back this up a little bit because hmm. I, I just want to show what it w looks like when it works. But actually, no, it doesn't matter. It, this doesn't matter. Um, the, the, the point is, this is what this looks like. And then you go through and you go add to cart and, and then it, it'll give you a price. But that's really, that's really all it is to, to ordering DNA. Um, you know, so you, you're going to have to futz with their, their tool a little bit. Um, you know, make sure that it, it detects the right enzymes, make sure you're pasting it in correctly. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and then we're, then we're basically done for the day and we're going to, I'm going to do questions and then call it, um, is this website. So we used Fuji FP uh, because it's one that I know. Um, but let's say, for example, you, you just, you want a fluorescent protein, but you don't know which. Um, this website is a fantastic resource for that. And it's, it's not every fluorescent protein that exists, but it is a lot of them. Um, unfortunately, Fuji FP is not in this database, but you know, that's a bummer. Um, but one of the things that this lets you do is you go spectra viewer, eh, close all this, um, or you go um, like FP collections. Come on, where's the tools? Microscope, blast, calculator. Oh, no, it's explore. Explore is what I was looking for. Um, so if you click lineage, this is, and it, again, this is not inclusive. This is not every fluorescent protein that exists, but it is a lot of them. So you can see this one, AVGFP, is the very first green fluorescent protein that was isolated in 1992. Um, all of these other proteins are all proteins that are derivatives of that original GFP out of that original jellyfish. And if you click on any of these, so let's say cerulean, because I, I quite like cerulean. It's a really, it's a really pretty color. Um, it gives you all of this information. So it shows you the lineage. It gives you the derivatives. It gives you a spectrum. So the, the absorption curve and the emission curve. So this is the light that you've got to shine on it to make it glow. And this is the glow color that comes out. Um, it also has, you know, some more information here. It gives you the organism that it came from. It gives you a, how many copies of the protein um, uh, are... Um, like, like stick together because fluorescent proteins often come as uh, a multimer. So sometimes it's a dimer. So it's, it's two proteins stuck together. Sometimes it's a tetramer. So it's four. Uh, but in this case, it's a monomer. So it's a single protein. Um, it gives you all the color. And then at the bottom here, it gives you amino letters. And as long as you've got amino letters, you can back translate into code. So let's just do this really quick, just for the sake of the, the exercise. So I, I just copied that. I just pressed control copy, you know, then you can go back here. You can go new amino acid sequence, new amino acid, M sir, oh geez, sir, Ulean. I'm bad at spelling, but let's pretend that that's what it is. Um, and then you can just paste that in. And then you can do exactly what we did before, which is, you know, highlight it. Oops. Got to click directly on it. Back translate E. coli, um, NCOI, uh, NDI, hind three, preview optimization. That's going to do its thing. It's got to think about it for a minute. And then it's done it. Save as new sequence. Save in the same spot. You know, this is now here. So you can highlight it, annotate it. Seru Leon probably spelled wrong, but that's okay. I'm gonna make it blue because it's blue. Save, copy it. And then we could go here and I could just, the nice thing is now that we've got this all set up, I can just click on Fuji FP, right? Um, because it does, it leaves our stop codons alone. It's just the protein that we want to get rid of. Um, and I can go paste. And now it's cerulean. It's, it's literally that easy. It's, it's literally, literally that easy. Um, and then you can just, you know, put it in order for this and have it made. Um, the other, um, 
printer system, like the other like printing company that I want to mention quickly is Twist Bioscience. Um, they're better for printing. Like their their printing is very cheap, uh, but they're kind of weird about submitting custom DNA, um, and they're they're like they're 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 also very picky about what DNA that they're actually able to print. GenScript is fantastic because they will print functionally anything. Like I've I've handed I've asked them to print some extremely difficult DNA and they were able to do it. It took them a while, but they were able to do it. Whereas uh, Twist is like if there's even a single repeat, they sort of have a fit and then just can't uh, like just can't deal with it. Um, but if you want to have like a, a fragment printed so that you can actually do some of the assembly of the so like what I just basically taught you how to do is save you a whole bunch of time because you could it is cheaper. Uh, so for example, right, I could go on Twist and, you know, you order like a little bit of extra code because you always want to have a little bit of extra hanging off the ends there. So you could order like this piece, for example, right? And, and you could, and just this little piece will show up in a tube. And then you could process it with NDI and HIN3 and then go through the process of manually inserting this into your plasmid. But that's generally a humongous pain and can be very slow and it's it's just it's a lot of work um so you could do that and you're saving money on the printing but you're losing money on the actual doing right because you're gonna end up burning days doing this and if you're be and let's say your your base salary is like 15 dollars an hour or 20 dollars an hour or 25 dollars an hour like Three or four days of you messing around with this is it's now would have been cheaper if you just ordered it from GeneScript to just have them print it and, and put it together for you. It'll take them longer, but you're saving your own time. And so you end up being able to do more because you're wasting less time in the lab. Um, so, yeah, always if you can and if you can afford it, I would always recommend just having complete plasmids printed rather than fragments because it, it just saves so much time. Uh, and headache and effort and suffering. Uh, so yeah, highly recommend that. But yeah, this is this is sort of the basics. You you if you put this order in, and then you follow the instructions that uh, I showed in uh, some previous videos and in the newest short and and all this kind of stuff, you could then take this and put it into E. coli and it'll work, right? Like this this code. I can. I would guarantee that this code works. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It works. It works perfectly. Um, so, this is the most basic form of writing DNA um, that there is, basically, because everything else is just variants on this. So, if you understand this, and if you can understand these basic fundamentals, then you can watch the Whose Gene Is It Anyway streams, which I'm hoping to do more of, um, and understand what it is that I'm doing. Like, it's just this, but more of it. Um, you know, maybe there's more complicated things. Maybe I'm having to, you know, futz with, with you know, more complex uh, promoters or interactions or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's all just this, and then you order the DNA, and then you test it. So yeah, that's that's pretty much that's that's pretty much the basics. Um, so now we're gonna go into to question time. I hope you guys have uh, enjoyed this uh, this you know little tutorial, this little uh, this little walkthrough on on how to print DNA. And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer some questions, and um, then then we're gonna then we're gonna call it for the day. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, question time. Alrighty. Okay, so where did I leave off before? Um, okay, is there an easy, accessible way for me to get my DNA sequenced so I have a file on my computer that contains my DNA? I don't mind spending some thousands of dollars. Uh, 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 actually, I don't mind spending some thousands of dollars. Um, so there's a few companies that do this. Um, I, I haven't, I don't really have much experience with any of them. So I, I can't really recommend any specific one. So unfortunately, I, I can't really be of much help there. Um, there's a few, uh, but you kind of just have to look around. But but there are services for this. Just Google it and, and you'll find it. Um, what else we got? Um, 
is the RBS behind the promoter? Yeah, so so I can, so I can actually, I'm going to go back to the scene for a second. So the ribosome binding site is right here. So you've got promoter and then a spacer and then ribosome binding site. So yeah, the ribosome binding site is always between the promoter and the start of the protein. Uh, okay, what else? Um, uh, how similar to binary, zeros and ones, is DNA coding? Uh, I mean fairly in the sense that you know you're you're working at like the nearly the transistor level type or the equivalent right like you you really do have to mess with every individual letter as if you're changing every individual zero and one um but i mean it's it's not binary because there's four letters and then the three the four letters are broken into sets of three and there's 21 sets of things so you know there's it, it, it's similar ish but it's it's not a perfect comparison um, is there a tool that translates DNA code into what it does? No, that's, that's a compiler. That's, and, and no such thing will exist or, 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 or does exist or will exist for at least a century, if I had to bet, um, if not longer, because it, it's an unbelievably difficult pro, uh, uh, problem. Um, okay, what else we got? Um, can algae be bioengineered to survive on Mars or in any part of Mars? Uh, I mean, probably, uh, it'd be tricky. You'd have to modify Mars a little bit first. Um, the biggest problem is there's just not a lot of gas. Like there's just physically not a lot of atmosphere on Mars. So most organisms are going to desiccate very, very, very quickly. Um, so I mean, yeah, again, yeah, probably, but it would be very difficult. Um, do you know how strictly by, oh no, I, I've answered this one already is how strictly is bio, is bioengineering regulated in Europe? And the answer is very, um, uh, do you personally have any concerns about people with bad intentions using this technology once it becomes more available to the masses? Okay. Here's the thing, right? The people this is, this technology is the most available to already is academics and academics are terrifying. Uh, because academics have access to enormous quantities of money and, and materials and reagents that allow them to do essentially whatever they want. So, for example, am I worried about some schmuck in their garage making a virus that is dangerous? No, because they're almost exclusively more likely to infect and kill themselves than they are just about anyone else. But an academic, on the other hand, not only can they do this, they have done this. So there was a study a few years ago uh, where just to prove the point that it could be done, uh, a, a group of academics had thousands of very, very tiny pieces of DNA printed and then manually put all of those pieces together. And what they'd ended up printing out was horse pox. Like they did this on purpose just to, again, like to show that that was what, that they, it could be done. But they managed to make functional horse pox using only like, oligos that any company is willing to print and because the dna pieces were so tiny it didn't set off any alarms uh or or uh, restrictions or anything that these companies are supposed to have um, because again there's no laws against printing primers right like if you're testing for horse pox you're using the same bits of dna as if you had it but if you had enough of them you could build the whole bit of dna so yeah no i'm, I'm not worried about the masses having access to this. It's it's nation states and academics that are way scarier. Um, so, you know, uh, anyway. Um, are there any software aside from Benchling that you would recommend? I mean, it sort of depends. I don't really use much else. Um, you know, Genome Compiler was great, but it, it's been relegated to oblivion, so it's, it's not functional anymore. Um, I hate Snapgene. Don't use Snapgene. It's expensive garbage. Just don't use it. It's not worth it. Um, so, you know, not, not helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really use a lot of other software. Um, the, the only other one that I've used is um, AlphaFold. Uh, we have a, an instance of it running on our, on our server at the lab. Um, and that's really helpful. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I'll show in a stream at some point. But uh, AlphaFold is the closest thing to a compiler that there is. It, it basically would let me, like, if I had AlphaFold running, I could just, you know, copy this. Right, from there to there. Um, somebody just donated. Thank you, Derp Mick Engineer Face. Greatly appreciate it. Um, 
uh, you know, so I could copy this this uh, sequence um, and paste this amino sequence into uh, AlphaFold, and it will spit out a 3D model of what this protein looks like. And it's amazing. Uh, so I, I highly recommend that if you can find an instance of it. Uh, but other than that, not really. Um, okay, what else? Uh, how is that related to lipid nanoparticles? We've learned about these in my macromolecule class, but it, I've, again, never gone into depth into drug delivery systems. Uh, lipid nanoparticles are simply a method for delivering DNA or RNA. That's, there, that's really all there is to it. Um, if you're, if you're transfecting, um, like mammalian cells, you'll, you'll often use a lipid based carrier because it's just a really convenient way of doing that. Um, okay. What else we got? Um, can, <laughs> can you modify Benchling to add a proper button to export to GenScript? No, <laughs> it's, it's not my tool. Like it's, it's a free tool, but it's not a, a tool where you can like install plugins as far as I'm aware. So unfortunately that's not possible. I think the, the like, uh, industry version of Benchling, cause this is the free version. Um, there's like a, an industry version that is like $10,000. It's very expensive. Um, that might be able to do stuff like that, but I, I don't, I don't know. Um, can you use the gene that makes animals change color in their environment? Is that a thing? Um, technically, yes. So like you could, like there's, there's, there was this idea for a while of, you know, how do you deal with radioactive material or, or, uh, like nuclear waste disposal sites far into the future and there was this proposal for what if you made cats that change color when they're exposed to radiation now the the trick is finding a bit of dna that responds to radiation and that's really hard um also like like getting an animal to do this would be very difficult because you'd have to have like it'd be it have you'd have to have the dna be sensitive to like something the animal eats or something whereas if you wanted to make a plant that changes color when certain things happen like that's totally possible so it's actually very easy to make plants that will change color. So let's say you took a, a white flower, right? And you you built a circuit that would detect a heavy metal. So let's say cadmium. So you could build a, a genetic circuit that when it detects... So in the same way that like this DNA turns on when lactose is present, you could do the same thing with cadmium. So you could have like a cadmium-sensitive promoter that will turn on like M. cerulean or, or GFP or something... Um, or like RFP, so it's actually like colorful, uh, when cadmium is present in the soil. So you could plant, like, so you could get these plants and then spread them over an area and look for the red ones, and the red ones is where the cadmium is. So yes, that, that is actually totally possible. Um, all right, well, that's that's everything off my list. I'm going to just uh, look through uh, the the comments briefly, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to call it a day. I hope you guys have enjoyed. This has been a lot of fun. Um, we're going to do some more Whose Gene Is It Anyway streams soon because we've kind of covered the basics of this. Um, there's, I've got a few more parts that I want to do of this series. Um, I really want to... Basically, I want to do a, a deep dive into uh, genetic circuits and genetic circuitry where you have uh, multiple uh, deep bits of DNA that are all interacting. So there's one really quick that I'm going to just look up just so I can give you a taste of this repressilator. Um, I spelled that wrong, but this is the repressilator. So this is this is one of my favorite bits of uh, genetic circuitry that I learned about very recently. Um, and it's called the repressilator. So basically it's three genes that each repress the next one. So what you'll end up is uh, basically this is what happens. So you'll have one gene will, will spike, but because it's spiking, so like, let, let's say that repressor one is being made. So that turns off repressor two, which means repressor three starts being made. But when repressor three, three starts being made, that turns off repressor one and so on. And so it just goes around and around. So you end up with these spikes of different proteins being made. And then if you have this cycle going, you can basically hitch a second plasmid um, that turns on a different gene, depending on which one of these is, is running. So now you've got like a, a cycle going where you can, you know, have things turn on in sequence. Um, and so it'll actually look like this, where if you've got a different fluorescent protein tagged to each of the different repressors, 
um, you'll have a colony that'll look like this. So you'll have rings. So you'll have red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, green, you know, like, so it, it does that and it looks absolutely crazy. I desperately want this DNA. It's just really expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's kind of neat. As, and what's, what's interesting about it, as long as you have three or an odd number of repressors, uh, you'll, you'll have this cycling. Whereas if you have an even number, it'll, it'll just like two will turn on and then it'll just balance out. Um, but yeah, anyway, so this is all, I want to do a deep dive into this. I'm going to do a whole stream about this in the future. Um, but yeah, if you guys, uh, it, so just uh, like I say, as I'm, as I'm looking for, um, as I'm looking for more questions, um, if you guys want to support the show, the, the donations are always greatly appreciated. Um, if you, uh, want to join Patreon or as a YouTube member, that's also greatly appreciated. Um, as I said at the beginning, the, the new year brings with it a deluge of new content. Um, I know there hasn't been main channel videos on the, uh, on the channel in a while, but that is absolutely changing. Um, we have the next eight months of content where we're getting at least one main channel video out a month, hopefully, um, already planned and in the works. So there's a lot of new stuff coming out. I'm very, very excited. Some of it is just the most crazy bonker stuff that we've done. And I'm really, really excited. Um, but yeah, so if you want to support the show and, and, uh, you know, help, help keep the stream streams coming, you know, donations or Patreon or any of that kind of stuff is, is really greatly appreciated. Um, the, like I say, the, the who's gene stream, uh, I'll probably do one next month instead of, uh, the part three of this, um, just so we can have a little fun. Um, and then I'll do part three of this series, um, uh, probably in April, probably in April, um, and yeah, if there's a, if there's anything specific that you want to learn or, or see about, um, you know, leave them in the comments. And uh, yeah, um, I also I, uh, somebody who asked is uh, Food Channel videos planned? Yes, there there are Taste Emporium videos that are planned. There's Thought Emporium videos that are planned. Also, we've made a we've made a new TikTok. So for those of you who 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 do the TikToks, um, you know, uh, look at the Thought Emporium on TikTok. There's there's lots of new stuff there too. Um, there's, so we've got shorts, we've got streams, we've got long videos, we've got TikToks, we've got Instagram reels. There's a huge amount of stuff coming out. Uh, if you don't follow me on Instagram yet, be sure to do that. Uh, there should be a link in the description. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that goes out on there. Um, basically, yeah, no, there's a, there's a whole bin, bunch of new stuff coming out and I'm very excited to show it all off. We've built some absolutely crazy machines over the last 10 months and I'm, we're, they're, they're getting ready to be shown on video. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. We've got some absolutely massive bioreactors. We've got a wet spinning machine. We got lasers, we've got incubators, we've got all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, I hope you guys uh, stick around and are, are uh, you know, going to enjoy all the stuff that's coming out. So yeah. Um, yeah. And also, yeah, don't forget to like the stream. It's all, always appreciated. Okay. Let's, uh, let's take one or two more questions and then we're going to wrap it up for the day. Cause my, my voice is just like, my throat is on fire. <laughs> I've been talking nonstop for two and a half hours. Um, uh, the spider silk, I can't really talk about. Um, it's like I say that, that project has gone dark. Uh, we're, we're actively working on it. That's most of what we've been doing for the last 10 months. Um, uh, but beyond that, I, I can't really talk about it. Um, when, when there's an announcement, there'll be an announcement, but there won't be an announcement for a while. Um, all right. What else we got? Um, uh, sponge silk, sponge silk. Uh, anything fun? Any, any good questions? Uh, are there any requirements to joining the website to use? I assume you're talking about Benchling, which is, which is this one. Uh, and no, there is not. Um, this is, it's, it's totally free to use. Uh, which is why I use it. Um, uh, for a person that's starting to, starting university next year, what is your recommendation on what to do to try to get involved in genetic engineering? Um, okay, like I like I said earlier, um, you'll you'll have more success in university <laughs> than you will uh, on your own. Uh, but if you want to if you want to try some genetic engineering. Um, there's a company called Amino.Bio that sells some actually really great kits. Um, I'd, I'd highly recommend them. Um, they're, they're high quality. They, they, they work really well. They're very well documented. So if you want a taste of, of doing this, um, that's, that's a really great way to do it because it, it comes with everything that you need. So yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's a good one. Um, just seeing if I missed any questions from people who donated. Uh, no, I think I got them all. 
Um, uh, the Neuron Project. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk quickly about the Neuron Project and then I'm going to uh, uh, call it for the day. Um, okay, so the Neuron Project is actively being worked on. It is, in fact, the the the, next, the first video, the first main channel video that's coming out is step one in the Neuron Project. So for those of you who caught the Neuron stream, oh God, it was almost a year ago now. Um, the first step was building a mammalian incubator for actually physically growing the neurons. That is now complete. The, the neuron incubator has been built. So we're just testing it out with some skin cells first. Um, and if those grow properly, then the next step is growing neurons. Um, I'm also working on a, there's a, basically a system for turning skin cells directly into neurons. And, uh, you know what, I'll see if I can just find it really quick. Um, uh, neuron. Neuron. Uh, images. No. Um, okay, I can't find it. Whatever. Um, I'll, I'll, this will be in a, in a stream, or, or actually it's going to be in a whole video. But basically, um, in terms of the neuron project, Thing number one, we're gonna we're gonna practice growing some neurons. So very 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 soon, we're gonna be growing uh, neuron projects, or we're gonna be sorry, we're gonna be growing neurons, um, and also modifying them. So we're gonna be doing brainbow to them. Uh, so we're gonna be doing this in vitro. Um, so so this is going to be the first part of the neuron project that you're going to see, which is we're going to be growing the neurons and we're going to be modifying them so they do this. Um, this this uh, genetic construct is called Brainbow. I love it. It's, it's one of my favorite because it's just so pretty. Um, but basically it labels every cell a different color. Um, and if you do it right, you, you end up with this like rainbow of, of colors. Um, so this is going to be the first step of the neuron project. We're going to grow neurons and we're going to modify them so that they do this. Um, then there'll be a second video where uh, we'll try and modify them with a different protein that um, basically flashes every time a neuron fires. So that it basically it, it expresses a protein that becomes fluorescent right after a neuron fires and then goes back to a dark state afterwards. Um, so we can actually see the neurons thinking. And then the last video is going to be the actual neuron arrays. So it's building the neuron arrays, r growing neurons on them. Um, and we'll also have a separate video where we directly, or we're, we're going to try this. I mean, who knows if it works, but there's a way to basically directly reprogram, um, skin cells or, or any tissue sample into neurons. And so we're going to be doing that as well. Um, so yeah, neurons are, are going to be a big part of this year. Um, I'm very excited for that. Um, you know, the, I, I think that's, I think that's going to be one of the better ones. Um, uh, I just, I just want to see if I can find a picture of it because it's so cool. Um, no, it's it's not cooperating. Oh, maybe, 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 maybe. Um, but yeah, basically, there's a there's a way to go from uh, fibroblasts, right? So skin cells um, uh, into a neural stem cell and then into neurons. Um, so it's it's there's it's basically just a process for this. Um, it's you add a whole bunch of different chemicals to it and some DNA and it it kind of does the thing. So we're gonna do this as a video at some point. It's just it's really expensive, so I'm I'm holding off for a little bit, um, just because the like you see how it it lists all these different chemicals here. Yeah, you gotta buy all of these. So when you buy all of them, it's like two grand worth of different chemicals that you need just to be able to do this. Um, I already have the DNA, which is nice, but so you know that cuts down the cost a little bit. But it's still it's a very expensive project. So, um, you know, that's, that's a thing. Um, somebody asked, where's the GitHub? There's a link in the description. Um, so if you're looking for the GitHub, just look down there. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's where we're going to wrap it up. I, I hope you guys have enjoyed. This has been a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, 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 I had a lot of fun. I, I, I hope you enjoyed. Um, we're going to be back with another stream next month. We're going to be, have a main channel video out hopefully in a couple of weeks. Um, keep an eye out for all the shorts and TikToks and all that kind of stuff. Be sure to subscribe, like, all that stuff. Thank you, everybody who donated. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, you know, be sure to join the Patreon, and then you can hang out on our on the Thought Emporium Discord. And, you know, there's always some good chats there, and you can see what we're working on. But, yeah, other than that, I'm going to end it there. I hope you guys have enjoyed, and I will see you next time.